You know it's this. Take a perk and talk it and see. Money swallowing like six. Did it perfect to the kid. Got a million on my head. I'm a better player than a robot. Just win. I don't want to get a million dollars. The devil that's it. And I chip it again. Hello and welcome back, fellow anime lovers, to Manga Muse. I am delighted to have you join us once again in the world of fanfiction and fantasy. This is the 14th part of What If Deku Helps His Best Friend, Peter Parker. Smash the like, share and subscribe button for more. Also press the bell icon so that you never miss such great parts. Thanks for the introduction. Now let's dive into the world. In a rundown apartment at the edge of Tokyo in a certain ward, the hero killer Stain felt an unfamiliar feeling. Ever since he had started his crusade, the role that he'd embraced was clearly defined. A hunter, the savior who purged the weak-willed heroes that would only bring down society as their existence and ideologies spread. He would lure them into a trap, and like the foolish pretenders that they were, they would fall for it. That's how it was supposed to be, how it was meant to be until only a true hero was left. Until All Might was all that was left. At his hand, Stain's crusade could end the way that it was meant to. Yet here he sat, on the remains of a couch, bandaging his wounds after barely escaping with his freedom. The hero, Yorai Musha. Even without exchanging words, Stain knew what he was like. It was all in the way the old man fought. And fought well. Had the old man been aiming for the kill, he probably wouldn't have been able to get out of that alley with his head attached. The old man had clearly intended to bring him in. What a joke, being forced to act like prey by one that didn't hold the same conviction that Stain did. He pulled the bandages taut with his teeth, ignoring the spike of pain as his shoulder screamed. Not the best work, but it would let him hold a blade again if it came down to it. From a dust-covered box, he pulled out a water bottle and some wrapped protein bars. Looking at them both, they were the last supplies that he had for this particular safe house. He'd need to relocate, both to resupply as well as find the time to heal. If Chisholm ran into another hero like Musha, or even someone beneath him without a plan again, he wouldn't make it. So till his wrist healed, he would need to move. Move, but not without information. Groaning, the hero killer walked over to the windowsill of the safe house and turned the receiver on a portable radio. He tuned it to the police line. It wasn't one that some of the heroes would use, but the heroes always relied on the police to narrow down their search vectors. The radio sparked, and someone called in something about Fifth Avenue for Hasu being cleared. Stain let his tired body hit the couch. He needed to rest, but not until he knew what routes he could take through to get to the next safe house, preferably one outside of Tokyo to lay low. Katsuki grunted as he pulled up, chin rising above the bar for the 30th time before he descended. Finishing his set, he let out an exhale before picking up a towel to wipe his brow. He could feel his stomach growling lightly, but this was his routine. A strenuous workout before breakfast. Gang Orca's gym was impressive, including up-to-date gym equipment and a boxing arena. He could even see a sand arena, like a giant sandbox of sorts for testing quirks. All in all, not bad at all. He took a deep breath before the blonde went over to the rower wearing a tank top, gym shorts, and his running shoes. He was up and early, with only a few others minding their own business on the treadmills and weights. Katsuki went to the machine and got the right weights in place, and then got to work. 20 reps and 5 sets should do it, then some cardio for cooldown. Focus only on his training. It was the only way he could get better. Nothing else mattered. Out of the corner of his eye, he saw a familiar figure walk on and clad in her workout jumpsuit before she walked over. Katsuki didn't pay much heed, counting mentally in his head as he got past 15. Hey, Tsunotori said. He offered a grunt in response, not even looking at her. You doing okay? His red eyes looked over to her in confusion, the shorter Hafu girl standing there with her arms crossed. Why wouldn't I be? Tsunotori's blue eyes quirked in puzzlement. Um, um didn't you hear? One of your classmates was attacked last night. After 20 reps, Katsuki let the machine rest and took a breath, shaking out his arms. One of his classmates. Who? And how? He heard her scoff in disbelief. Aren't you like, a part of a group chat? Me and my classmates are, and I heard class is in one too. I thought you would have known. Never bothered. Katsuki replied, uninterested. You're kidding me. Tsunotori replied, and Katsuki looked over at the blonde horn girl, her mouth agape. Ida got slashed. He was attacked by the hero killer. Ida. Four eyes got cut up. Katsuki mused aloud, then the gears in his head turned. Tsunotori looked baffled. Say, didn't his brother get fucked up too? I think so. Well, Katsuki placed his hands on the bars, ready to begin set two. He's got his own issues. If he went revenge hunting and got burnt, that's on him. Are you kidding me right now? Tsunotori blurted out in English, face looking red as her eyes widened. He's your classmate. You seriously don't even care. 
It's on him. Katsuki responded in English, eyes narrowed. And we're in Japan. Speak Japanese. I got my own problems, why should I? Because the world don't revolve around your dumb ass, that's why. The horn girl hissed, still in English. She did have that Texan accent after all. The least you could do is send condolences. A text. Or a simple that's horrible like any other decent human being. Nah, bottom line is all about you. Fuck anyone else. She scoffed. You don't know a damn thing about me, Katsuki growled. The horn girl gave a scoff. Please, get over yourself. You ain't that fucking complicated. Sunotori's eyes were narrowed, her tone high. Why the hell Orca brought you here is beyond me. She scoffed. It's like the school is bending over backwards for ya, just to give you a participation trophy. Katsuki was proud of his English as he heard that last bit. Participation trophy. Shut up, some of us actually want to work. Not bitch all day. He growled back. Yeah, she scoffed. I'm sure that work you're so busy with is worth it seeing how I've been walking up and down your ass like a treadmill for the last week. She glared at him before shaking her head. Whatever, I'm done with you. And with that, she turned around. Loser. She uttered under her breath before walking away. Katsuki felt his teeth grinding so hard that his jaw ached, while his grip on the bars made his arms tremble. He lost count of the reps by the time he stopped and his arms shook with having pushed his muscles to the point of failure. Four eyes wasn't his fucking problem and his stupid decision in going after the hero killer was no one's fault but his. What the fuck did she want from him? For him to stand on a fucking soapbox for the guy. His fingers trembled and twitched as he reached for the water bottle. Get over yourself. You ain't that fucking complicated. Loser. Katsuki grit his teeth as he chugged down the bottle, hand ready to blast it. Izuku sat in the dojo, staring at his phone. The messages from the group chat seemed frozen on his phone's screen. There was a childish part of him that wanted to blink and have the message disappear. It wouldn't. Heroes got hurt on the job, that was a fact of life. Going into a fight with a villain carried with it the same danger that you would expect. No one was immune to being hurt. People could die too. It was impossible to save everyone. Not even All Might, but that didn't change the facts. His friend was in the hospital, stable, but hurt. If that wasn't enough, his future as a hero was in question as well. It didn't make sense to Izuku. Aida had just wanted to bring in the villain that crippled his brother. To ensure there was no more ingeniums retiring too early. That's what heroes were supposed to do. Defeat the villains and protect people with a smile on their faces. And yet, Ida was in the hospital. Still worried about him. There was a twitch as Izuku naturally let out some surprise at the voice. But being with Ed shot for the duration of his internship made his sudden appearances easier to deal with. He'd still flinch and scream, but now, yeah, Izuku said softly. In the corner of his vision, he saw the ninja nod once before gently taking a seat next to All Might's young successor. He didn't say anything for a long while, before taking a deep breath. The waiting is always the worst part, Ed Shot said. Izuku looked down at the message again. D do you think that he can still be a hero? Ed Shot's face was a literal unmoving mask. There was no twitch or tell that clued Izuku into what the pro was thinking but eventually the hero shook his head. I don't know, he admitted, quirk and vigilante laws are strict for a reason. He's just a student, and an argument could be made that he went in trying to protect the fallen pro, but I wouldn't buy it. Izuku's eyes widened. B but I Ida was undergoing his internship. H he was just doing what he was supposed to. Again, Ed Shot shook his head. Again, there's a reason that the law distinguishes villains and criminals. A student working under a mentor while taking on a purse snatcher is one thing. Going after a hardened hero killer with no backup for revenge is another, Ed Shot explained. Especially during a mass villain attack, and ignoring that to sate your own grudge. It doesn't look good for Ida or Manuel in the end. Izuku took that explanation in, and his mind raced with what he remembered about Quirk Law. Even back when he first read it, he thought it was strange. If someone could help, why shouldn't they? Yet, knowing what he did now, he saw why it was needed. Hero work was dangerous, and any X-factors introduced could dramatically change the outcome of a situation. And not always for the better. Still, there has to be something we can do. Izuku asked. How? The ninja hero asked, curious and intrigued. I I don't know, Izuku admitted, but um, maybe we could help track down Stain. He still hasn't been captured and he needs to be brought to justice. Endeavor has that on lockdown. Ed Shot said with crossed arms, he's determined to be the one to take him in. His firm is working around the clock as well. Then we can help. Izuku declared, if we point him in the right direction maybe we can join him. He won't share the glory, Ed Shot started. Especially when he considers me a rival. It's not about the glory. Silence fell between the two as Izuku felt a confidence swell within the pit of his stomach. Aida and his brother work to bring Stain in, and he's my friend. If they can help him, then. 
then I'll do it. Edshot studied the boy for a second or two, and for one agonizing heartbeat, Izuku thought that Edshot would shake his head again. Then the corners of his mask stretched just a little bit, and his eye closed as he smiled. All right, we'll chip in where we can, he said. Izuku beamed. <clears throat> Peter was marching down the hallway. He knew that he should be resting after a hard workout. But ever since he got out of the shower and checked in with Karen he heard the news. The pit in his stomach was only growing with each step by the time he reached the lounge of Mirko's agency. He saw the top 10 heroine relaxing on the couch in her leotard, having showered herself with a protein shake at her side as she watched TV. The channel, some blathering talking heads with the caption, Hero Killer Strikes Again. Connection with Hasu Massacre. His classmate got maimed at the same time as the equivalent of a mass shooting took place, where dozens are dead and even more injured. Peter wasn't going to take no for an answer. Mirko, he stated, walking past the couch and seeing Mirko's red eyes shift to him. She was wearing her earmuffs, having just noticed him. Yeah, shouldn't you be resting? You look wound up. She drawled. We need to go hunt him down. He said, pointing at the words hero killer on the screen. Endeavor is leading the charge and finding him so let's coordinate and... No. Peter paused, eyes wide. No. Yeah. For one the hero killer, Stain, as the old samurai put it in an earlier interview, is not in my ward. And the closest one was Hasu, and he is long gone from that war zone. Endeavor's office isn't that close and he's still going. He has branch offices. He has the cash and clout to do that shit, considering he's the number two. And secondly, the white-haired woman scoffed. I work alone. And even if I didn't, working with a glory hound and a general ass like Endeavor is the last thing I wanna do. And should be for you too if you know what's good for ya, especially if you wanna advance in the rankings when you become a pro. His firm is a fucking mill. Peter bit his lip, pacing around a little as he tried to find the words. The last several days of patrolling, training, and learning under the rabbit hero was hard, yet at times fun. Some, not so much. But he was learning, growing to become a better hero. And yet, you don't want to stop a psycho serial killer who has murdered over a dozen and maimed more, all because he's not in your neighborhood. He surmised, looking at her. He could see Nikiri walk into the room out of the corner of his eye, curious on where the conversation was going. Endeavor and his hive of leeches will track him down eventually. Mirko turned back to the TV and reached for the remote, only for Peter to grab it. Her red eyes were on him, boring into him in anger. Hey, he hurt my friend. Peter stated, lips tight. Mirko narrowed her eyes. He's my friend and my class secretary. Yeah. He's been going through a lot since the sports festival. Peter muttered, looking down as he held the remote. I didn't realize he would. Actually do it. Hunt the hero killer. Peter nodded at the rabbit hero's answer as she sighed. Ingenium was being proactive in trying to hunt him down, but Hasu wasn't his jurisdiction. I can respect his go-getter attitude in trying to stop him, but the hero killer was above his pay grade, and he paid for it. You can say that, yet there's been no attacks from him in Endo. Yeah, Mirko retorted with a smirk. He knows better than to fuck with me, even when I'm patrolling cross-country. Whenever a villain causes a ruckus, I come back, find them, and kick their ass tenfold for it and leave them pissing out of a bag. And you better follow his lead. We aren't going after him, nor are we gonna work with anyone either to hunt him. Peter bared his teeth as he rounded on her. S should I get some tea? Nakiri piped in, hoping to dissolve the situation. If you can stop it, and don't. He snarled. Then you're responsible for what comes out of it. For what happens after. The shorter bronze-skinned woman had eyes of equal fury as she hissed. My decision is final, if you can't deal. Tough shit Parker. Suck it up. Mirko starred back at the TV. We'll go over some films today, this time of other heroes and simulation stuff. She placed her earmuffs back on and raised the volume, not even bothering to look at him. Peter didn't respond, slamming the remote back down on the table before he walked off. Parker Sam, Nakiri asked. I'll settle for water. He muttered under his breath, going to his room and slamming the door behind him. Peter flopped onto his bed, breathing hard into the pillow as he sighed out a groan. You're upset, came Karen's electronic voice in his earpiece. That's an understatement. Peter hissed under his breath as he turned. I was, even starting to like her too. She has a fair point. Heroes don't usually do business outside of their selected wards. Japanese Hero Regulatory Code Sect. I don't care about the law Karen, Peter sighed. I want to do what's right. He turned over in bed, grabbing his phone and seeing the group chat messages, all of them showing concern for Ida. I understand, but you do have a vigilante strike to your record. If you get another, it will cause problems. The boy closed his eyes. Yes, Karen was right. If he did go out there on his own and got caught without having his hero license, it would be another strike. 
It would cause so many problems for you and Mr. Fukuda. He doesn't want to think of the potential consequences if the Japanese government sought to revoke his forged visa and subsequently found out that it was forged. But still, do you wish to go regardless, Peter? She asked as Peter sighed. What can I do? You can't hack into police or government servers to get information, so we can't simply hack into the traffic cameras. The boy muttered. Those are in the hands of the pros, and I doubt Nikiri is gonna do anything to undermine her boss. He felt like a slowly deflating balloon. You are correct. I cannot access state, military, or government networks remotely. I can if I am inside. But considering our status and current situation, getting into a government building in this age of heroes and pulling it off would be a tall order. Damn it. Peter sighed, closing his eyes and slumping on the blankets. However, you are wrong in your assumption that hero servers are tied to government networks. Karen spoke in his ear, her tone smug and amused as Peter perked up in bed. What? I've been doing some probing and found out that hero servers aren't exactly listed within the rules and statutes of the Ultron safeguard. Karen would be smirking if Peter could see her face. His face lit up. You mean, I am gathering up as much information as I can from the Endeavor firm, along with any and all hero agencies that were involved with the hero killer past and present. Their firewalls are quite ineffective. The AI mused as Peter got up from bed, pulling out his phone and going to the Avengers app before opening it. He had the blue-white background of the symbol with the arrow, and then a screen of files being downloaded onto a cloud server. Peter grinned from ear to ear. So, shall we get started? We should be quiet, considering that Miss Yuzajiyama has astute hearing. Peter got up from bed, walking to the door and cracking it open a hair. He could still see the earmuff-clad ears of Mirko in the lounge chair from his view as she yawned, eyes half-lidded. I think we will be fine, but, he said after closing the door, whispering wouldn't hurt. Peter hushed silently as he returned to his bed and connected his charger to his phone. I agree. Karen replied back with a whisper, and Peter smiled. All right. He focused as he went through each file, seeing it get highlighted at certain parts instantly as Karen's AI went through each PDF, each case file, each report in the blink of an eye and cut out the clutter. Let's find this guy and stop him before he hurts anyone else. Izuku felt like he was going to fall asleep. He'd been staring at the map of Hasu Ward for hours within the hotel room they had rented. Breaks only coming from going to the bathroom or when Ed shot ordered takeout. His mentor flipped through a police report and blinked. There was a police blockage cutting off 5th and Waruka Avenue, Ed shot said. No reports of anyone coming through that match Stain's description. Izuku nodded, quickly marking the map in front of him with a red marker to designate the line of police that were there during the time of Stain's attack. It wasn't the first one that the two wrote down. The biggest areas of note were the confirmed engagements with the Naumus as well as the civilian paths to safety. So far nothing had came up. The villain had seemingly disappeared after his fight with the equip hero. There was nothing that even gave so much of a single grain of insight into how the villain managed to evade the heroes chasing him, which meant that they needed to erase the parts where he couldn't have been. After all, the city was still burning, and there were plenty of places to hide when everyone was working on the fires. Izuku's perked up, that was it. Do you have any reports from the fire departments? Izuku asked. Ed Shot's eyes flashed with understanding and the barest hint of a grin sprouted from behind his mask. Good idea, Deku, the ninja said, reaching for another file and handing it to the green intern. I was about to go on emergency calls myself. Do you think that someone saw him? Ed Shoot shook his head, with the city under attack, the chances of someone seeing him are minimal, but at least it gives us a vague idea of where the centers for damage were. Izuku nodded, eyes going over the fire department reports. One by one, he marked his map and after a while, Ed Shot came over to lend his expertise. Together, the two heroes stood in silence, comparing the maps, combining the areas of interest that were similar between the two and adding ones that were unique to one report over the other. Izuku watched the hero work, his mind racing for any other possibilities that they could use. What about the... I've already gotten several people going over the news footage, Ed Shot interrupted, his eyes never leaving the map in front of him. So far they haven't given me anything that we haven't already covered. Izuku's shoulders slumped. A rather difficult conundrum, isn't it? Ed Shot commented. Izuku nodded. The reports say that he fled by a rooftop. He said, flipping through that particular report, but where could he have gone that wasn't patrolled by heroes? Anywhere. Izuku flumbled with the report in his hands. You have to remember Deku. The city was on fire and the civilians were running for their lives from monsters that were killing them. Ed Shot said, the reports are only as accurate as the heroes that were able to make them at the time. 
in a perfect world. Everything in those reports is true and the heroes were able to account for every little thing. Remember, despite the persona that we adopt, at the end of the day, heroes are people too and they can make mistakes. He pointed to a patch of buildings on the south end of the map, much of which was marked as destroyed territory from the Namu's rampage. Take this south side. The reports indicate that there was a patrol through the area at 8.24 p.m. that was engaged with a Naomu who fled the downtown square where the massacre took place and engaged no one besides said Naomu until 8.37 p.m. and they didn't see anyone come through in that time on their street or by rooftop. Do you see the problem here? Izuku stared at the map, the marks that Ed shot had already made as well as the maps that were next to them. They were simple street-level maps, others were service maps, like the sewer. Izuku's eyes sharpened as he began to think out loud. He wasn't using the streets or the rooftops. Endeavor would have caught him, or someone would have made a call. Ed Shot nodded, indeed. Hasu is a modern city, and like all modern cities it needs an intricate plumbing system to get everything out. And Tokyo has several sewer refineries to help keep this municipality clean. He picked up another map, this one outlining the sewer system. The sprawling map of pipes and outputs dwarf the street view maps that they'd been looking at before. Right now, the refineries where he would reasonably be able to flee from are here, the pro said, marking an apartment complex at the edge of the district near downtown. Here, he said, marking a sports stadium within Hasu, and finally here, right outside an abandoned lot that was scheduled for demolition. Just outside the ward, the farthest one away. We can scratch off downtown, since the Naomu rampage was occurring and I doubt a wounded serial killer would hole up both during the chaos and in the aftermath when those monsters were being defeated. And the stadium is in a residential area. Izuku added, eyes going all over the map. We would have gotten a call if someone had spotted him. It's how Musha found Ida, via someone reporting it in. And by default, Ed shot pointed at the abandoned lot in the adjacent ward. Here is the most likely spot. Izuku broke into a grin. Then we can. Izuku, Ed Shot said, his voice stern. Look at where the lot is. It's an Akuto ward. Izuku blinked and carefully looked at the location. It was outside of Hasu. So, they had come from Kashiki ward after all. Lee but that should be fine. Izuku said, all we need to do is get authorization and we can go. That could take three days at a minimum. Akuto ward has quite the hoops to jump through to get a warrant compared to other wards, largely due to the fact that it has few pro hero firms there and it's the biggest industrial ward in Tokyo. Ed Shot said with a shrug, and at that point when the warrant comes in, he'll be long gone, even if he's there to begin with. Then what are we supposed to do? Izuku asked, eyes pleading, hoping for something, anything. Yet Ed Shot's single eye never flinched. We've done enough, he said, but now it's out of our hands. Even if he was using that area as a hideout, there will be forensic evidence left behind. It's better than nothing. But it's, we had forensics from Hasu, his katana and his knife. We, Izuku wanted to say something, anything to get the hero to change his mind. But nothing came out as he was at a loss for words. The older hero stood in front of him, and gently put a hand on the younger hero's shoulder. Izuku, there will always come a time where you'll have the chance to rush into danger, to help everyone in front of you. But there will also be a time where you have to hold yourself back, and believe that your comrades will prevail, to leave it to others more suitable. Izuku could only gawk, opening his mouth before he looked like a deflated balloon. I, yes sir. Good, I'll file the report and send it off to Endeavor and the heroes at Akuto. File everything here and call it a day. Don't cause trouble for the other agencies. Once again, the intern nodded, and Ed Shot removed his hand as he made his way out. You're a good boy, Izuku. But remember, there's the hero that you want to be. But sometimes, you have to put aside the hero you want to be and become the hero that you need to be. Izuku was silent, looking at the ground. Now I'm going on patrol. When I get back, we can go get dinner. I'm sure that we both need it at this time of night. With that, the ninja was gone, leaving Izuku standing there, with all his work, but feeling like he had nothing to show for it. All of that, and no criminal behind bars to show for it. It ate at him on the inside, choking at his heart as Izuku gritted his teeth. I can't accept this, he uttered to himself, exhaling harshly before he got up and paced. How could he do nothing while Stain was out there? He walked around the hotel room and sat down on the bed, head in his hands as he took a deep breath, dragging his hands across his face. Izuku gripped his fists as he looked down at the maps, glaring at that particular area. Stain was there. The one responsible for maiming and killing so many good heroes was there. And to just leave it be. Let Stain recover and go into hiding so he could plot and strike again. 
take another life, leaving another in the hospital like Ida, crippled like Ida's brother. No, besides, if Akuto didn't want to be helped, helping others when others don't ask for it is the biggest fundamental aspect of being a hero. It's what All Might would do, Izuku said to himself. Izuku's brain got to work as he began to gather up the maps and documents and scan them onto his phone via picture and app. He zoomed in as well to help clarify as he sent them to the email he had that was allowed access to Ed Shot's agency and by proxy the public safety commission that all pro heroes did business with. It might take three days on his end, but he'd make them jump the gun. He wouldn't let a hero be maimed like Ada again. Not when he had the power and responsibility to do something about it. Izuku inspected his hero gear, his green suit with arm and leg guards, and his custom metal gas mask that hung around his neck. He went to his backpack, grabbing his jacket and spare baggy workout pants he had brought along in case he needed them for pajamas and an all-nighter was required. He put them on over his gear, removing his gloves and metal mask and placing them in his hoodie's pocket. He grabbed his phone as well, pocketed his hands and left the hotel room, key in hand. He made his way out of the lobby after buying a breath mask from the concierge and strapped it on, the white mask covering his nose and mouth. With him claiming third at the sports festival, discretion was the better part of valor, and he was grateful to mom for getting him the baggiest sweatpants to help hide his armor as he got out and began walking, hands in his hoodie's pockets. The night was mild, a given how summer was right around the corner, then the humidity and monsoon season would be going like crazy with nighttime thunderstorms and 30 Celsius degree into the evening. He got his phone out, seeing that the data he had uploaded was now available for viewing. Izuku looked up, seeing a subway station close by as he went down the steps below to the underground terminal. He bought his ticket online, fingers a flourish as some night owls were gathering at parts of the station as well. Izuku kept to himself as he heard the sound of an incoming train and stayed still. The train roared past, wind passing through as Izuku kept his hands to himself, focusing on his plan. If word got out of Stain being found, the nearby hero firms would surely act. Endeavor would hightail it there, warrant be damned. But he had to get there first, to hold Stain down until they arrived. If the heroes and police swarmed the place, Stain would get spooked and disappear once again. The next train came to a stop, and he hopped on board after showing his ticket to the ticketeer within the subway cabin. He got in and settled down, sending the information to the server. It would take time to upload the information, but he could wait. Far atop of the hotel, a subway passed out from underground and onto a bridge-going ninja hero stood, eyeglass zooming in and spotting his intern in a car, eyes to the ground. He's going to do it after all. Ed Shot mused as he smiled to himself. Following rules and protocol were important when it came to being a pro, that was a fact. But being a hero meant doing what was right, doing what needed to be done. If Izuku was going on that train line, he was no doubt heading towards the abandoned lot in Akuto where Stain was presumably hiding. With a flash, Ed Shot was gone, zooming rooftop to rooftop as he progressed north, following the subway train. We have a hit. Peter perked up as he got up from his desk, shutting down his laptop windows of his homework that Mr. Aizawa handed out as he walked to the center of his room. It had been ten long hours. He did some workouts in that time, along with taking a nap as Karen went over anything he wasn't around for. He looked at his suitcase where it contained his suit. Where? He asked. I back-channeled a file sent from the Ed Shot Agency to the Akuto Police Department. Peter's eyes widened. That's east of here, right? He remembered going through it with Mirko only once along the edge. Definitely looked like Gangland. Like Hell's Kitchen back in New York. It is, and the files he sent over detailed the location of Stain's last known location since fleeing Hasu. By car, he's only a half hour away. Stain is there, I'll make it five minutes. Peter breathed, narrowing his eyes as he cracked open the door. He could hear the buzzsaw that was Mirko asleep in her room. Parker San came a voice as Peter jumped, opening the door all the way. Ah, I didn't mean to startle you. He turned, seeing Nakiri in the hallway, no longer in her formal colorful business attire, but in a black leather skirt, vest, blood red shirt and was she wearing mascara and a spiked collar. Oh, I suppose I forgot to mention. She said cutely as she fingered the hem of her skirt. Going out for some karaoke tonight. Nakiri sighed. Blow off some steam and all that. Oh, uh. Peter blinked, then smiled. Well, don't let me keep you. Have fun, Nakiri-san. He yawned a bit. Was gonna get some water before I head to bed. Big day with Mirko tomorrow. He said as he heard the rabbit hero snort in her room making him jump, but the snores still came. The tanuki lady simply smiled. Of course, I'll be back super late so don't worry about me. Just going to meet some old friends from high school. We try to catch up any time we can. 
she said. And don't worry about me and Marco San. The shorter woman reached into a cabinet, pulling out some earmuffs. These are the same custom brand Marco San uses for her own ears. She's more acute so she can hear clearly even with them on. But for us, she handed a pair to Peter, who took it. The moment he placed them on, the snoring was gone. He blinked, looking down and seeing the secretary beaming as she wore her own pair. They took them off. See what I mean? Yeah. Peter bit his lip. I can tell. I didn't hear much snoring before. It's her posture and that her face isn't in a pillow. Nekiri mused as she placed her earmuffs back in the cabinet. I have an extra in my room, in any case. She pulled out her phone after he heard the ping of a text. My ride is here. You get some good night's sleep, okay? Peter rested his arm against the doorframe and nodded, grinning. Have fun and good night Nekiri-san. He waved, seeing the girl walk off. He could hear, screeching death metal in the distance. His eyes widened. She is into that. Peter muttered to himself as she got to the front door. When she opened it, he could hear the satanic voices and hardcore guitars before she closed it. But she sounded happy calling out to some friends. Well, to each their own. He closed the door as a precaution and went back to his phone. What do we got? An abandoned hospital that is close to a sewage refinement plant in Ekuto. That is the last known locale listed in Edshot's server. It'll take time for them to get a warrant too. Peter mused as he walked over to his suitcase. And if many pro heroes show up, he'll get spooked and run off. We'll lose the trail. Whoever submitted that has done their homework. Yeah. Peter began to strip off his workout fatigues, going down to his undergarments and slipping into the red and blue spider suit. He tapped on the button, prompting the suit to fit itself to him as he grabbed his mask. Turning off the lights, slipping the clothes under his bed, he silently walked out the door as he could still hear Mirko snore. Good, keep on sleeping. Peter got to the front door for the darkened agency and opened it before locking it behind him. He turned and made a mighty leap over to the next building across the street upon ensuring that no one was within sight. He let out a sigh, then saw his mask. He donned it, and Spider-Man's HUD came to life. Show me the way, Karen. On it, he saw the map come up on the screen, and in the distance, red markers and the word for target were spotted many miles away. There's a sewer plant both in Shinjuku and Kijimi, and the next closest one. Peter saw a map of the greater Tokyo area pop up, red dots lining out the various plants. Is in Akuto, closest to us. He finished as he jumped to his feet. We move fast and quiet. He aimed his webs and took off into the night. Izuku landed on the roof, his foot cracking against the ground with barely enough force to disturb a bird. All the training with Ed shot on controlling one for all was starting to pay off. He checked his phone. He was going in the right direction, and if he went a little faster he'd be there within a half hour or so. It was already dark, and there would at least be six hours till sunrise. Getting back to the hotel should be doable if everything went well. He'd lose some sleep, but that detail was inconsequential in the grand scheme of things. Which, when thinking back on his time in UA so far, things going well wasn't an often occurrence. That didn't mean that he couldn't try. The plan was simple, if not risky. Confirm Stain's location, and call it out as soon as he saw him. If he was spotted first, he'd engage, if only to keep him occupied until said help arrived. Endeavor would come and bring everything that he had to bear down on Stain the second that he got the chance. Though, there was a lingering voice in the back of his head that warned him against it. Stain was a monster of a villain. He'd engaged with Ingenium and Yorai Musha, and before that, under three dozen heroes either being maimed or killed, Ida and his brother being among them. One he defeated and another he was able to fight off. Even if he received injuries from his clash with the top 10 pro, there was no way Izuku could perform at the same level as the equip hero. If it came down to it, he'd have to hope that his control of one for all would be enough to let him keep his distance. If not, he had 10 fingers to use. If unleashing a flick of power from one for all wasn't enough to bring police and heroes towards the battle, nothing would. Even in this dilapidated area of Akuto Ward, Izuku shook his head, he shouldn't think about that. Focus on the positives, and everything he could use to keep it like that. He'd just stay on guard, and keep an eye out for anything. He made his way to a rooftop and slowed his run as he knelt down, looking out at the sight before him. Tall warehouses were mixed in with blue-collar shops, all closed for the night. Scant few light posts flickering. Cracks in the pavement. In the distance, high-rise cheap apartments and along the ground, Izuku could make out some tents. Even in an age of quirks, there would always be big cities with the heavy blue-collar industrial areas combined with poverty. The trash of Tokyo had to go somewhere, with Akuto Ward and the northern parts of Hasu being that place. He sighed as he focused on the site before him, and he remembered the map. Izuku squinted his eyes, and about a block away, he could see the clear white domed infrastructure of the sewer refinery plant. 
with several smokestack factories and solar power stations nearby. The main abandoned lot looked perfect for the hideout of a devious villain, a derelict hospital, decaying and windows broken in. Graffiti painted the walls amongst its lower floors. All he had to do was go inside and quietly find Midori. Ah, uh, Izuku shrieked. Lightning sparked across his forearms as his quirk came to life on instinct, only to fizzle out in a series of disappointing sparks when he blinked at the sight in front of him. Red and blue with glowing dim blue eyes as the figure backed off in surprise. But that voice, Parker Sam, Izuku squawked, What are you doing here? Says the other guy jumping over rooftops at midnight. His spider-themed classmate said, crossing his arms. What are you doing here? Izuku blinked. T that didn't answer my question. And, Izuku mused as he looked over his costume. So is that a new costume of yours? Well, it's similar to my old one I used before. Parker looked at his glove. But, I suppose in your eyes it's new. So, to answer the question, I guess you're here in the Tokyo Projects for a patrol at this hour. Izuku opened his mouth, then closed it. No, I'm here to find him. He said as he turned towards the hospital. Sitting against the brick rail is to not attract eyes from any vagrants down below. Parker remained silent, taking a seat beside him as the green-haired boy turned to face the costumed hero. The guy who messed up Ida. Stain. Yeah. Izuku's fists tightened. Me and Ed Shotsan were looking over and investigating all possible leads and we found a possible location. But Ed Shotsan said it would take a few days to process a warrant. He raised his head, eyes hard. I can't just let the hero killer slink back into the shadows. Not after what he's done. Parker was quiet, nodding. So, it was you who uploaded the data to the servers. Izuku perked up and turned. I did, yes. Or you. Also looking into him. The American paused at Izuku's answer. Well, I had access to the Public Safety Commission and Mirko's website. So I found the info and Peter shrugged, got dressed, and headed out. Is Mirko san with you? Izuku asked, head on a swivel looking for the top 10 pro. He'd always wanted to meet the rabbit hero in person. Peter was interning under her too, out like a light and snoring like a chainsaw. Parker replied wryly, and even if she was awake, she wouldn't head over here, at least, not anywhere outside her ward whenever she's not doing her cross-country patrols. And since this is Akuto and not Endo, puzzled, Izuku finished for him. Still, why didn't she take up investigating Stain? Didn't want to work with Endeavor, or anyone else for that matter. Peter spat, blue eyes on his mask narrowed. Hates teamwork apparently. Yeah, she's not the type to work with a group unless a disaster hits or a special occasion called by the safety commission. Izuku replied. That was pretty common knowledge to those who follow the top 10. Still, I have to do something you know, Peter said with a sigh. If there's a killer out there and they hurt one of my friends, even if Mirko doesn't like it, I'll tell it to her face that I went along with it anyway. Even if it's another vigilante strike, right? Izuku mused, causing the American to turn towards him. It was you at the train station during Mount Lady's debut, right? Peter nodded. Yeah, what about it? Well, you have ample enough reason to not get in trouble. I mean, being a foreign exchange student, already having a strike to your record. If you get caught Agai Izuku had a hand on his shoulder as his green eyes stared into the wide blue eyes on Peter's mask. Don't worry about me or any record stuff. I'm here to take a bad guy off the street. Peter's cheekbones rose in a smile. That is our job as heroes after all. Take out the bad guys, protect the good guys. Izuku couldn't help but return it, his heart warm. Yeah. Peter's hand rose to his chest, and he tapped the black spider sigil on his chest. Izuku's eyes quirked in confusion before the sigil moved, and it even began to fly and hover like a drone. It was a drone. What the? Is that a drone? Izuku said, eyes wide as the spider-like robot landed on the concrete floor before them. He could see its tiny glowing eyes as it stood on all its legs. Yeah, okay. Peter had a hand to his mask. Go inside the hospital and see if our hero killer is there. He set his hand down and don't try to cause attention. Peter's mask eyes flashed as Izuku blinked. Then he saw the drone take off. Wait, was that a woman's voice coming from Peter's mask? Parker Sam, did I hear a voice coming from your mask? He asked, what are you doing? Well, first off, yeah, it is. Peter smiled. That drone is. How do I put this? He mused, hand to his chin. Um, I like those robots from the USJ. Me and Hatsum have been working on it together. That's awesome. So that's what you've been doing after school a lot in the support department. Izuku asked, amazed. Yeah, gave her a name too. Karen, you know, like with that Lisa or Penny AI you see from those smart home systems Amazon sets up. Peter laughed a little. The blue eyes were glowing and flashing. Okay, going through the air vents, nice. You have a direct video feed. Izuku asked in a loud whisper. Peter nodded. 
Yeah, this mask can see whatever Karen can see and so on. Right now, just combing through. We find him, then we bring him in. Izuku perked up. I in truth I was only coming here to confirm if he was here, according to the investigation reports that is. Izuku stammered, biting his lip. If he was, I was thinking he was cut off as Peter raised a finger, and his hands cupped his ears. Izuku leaned in close, anticipating any sounds. What is it? He whispered softly. I see him. Peter said silently, his voice becoming terse. He's awake, looking at a map too. Some marks around it in blue, some red. Zooming in, that looks like Hasu, the red. Native, Izuku whispered, realizing what those marks were. What are the blue markings? Peter was quiet, and Izuku could make out a female voice in Peter's ear speak out in English. Cross-reference Tokyo area map with locations of Stain's attacks. All red marks indicate fatalities. Blue are unknown, but we are 60 yards away from a blue marking. The green-haired boy caught that, thankful for his studies in English. Safe houses, Izuku uttered, to which Peter turned, then his eyes widened and recoiled. Izuku did so too, and oh gosh he was so close to his face. As sorry, I just wanted. It's fine. Just, give me some personal space. Please, Peter asked. Izuku's face was beet red, his hands on his lap as he puffed out his cheeks. Peter has this kind of high-tech gadgets on hand in a costume that didn't look as sophisticated as the one that was destroyed at the USJ. On top of his experience and accolades and no time. Focus on staying and helping Parker. He's packing up his bags. Peter uttered in English as he lifted his head. Going to be moving to the next safe house for him to lie low and heal some more. We can't lose him now. We should call for Endeavor and the others. Make the call. We call for help and we fight him until the cavalry arrives Peter uttered. Then we need to make sure he doesn't have the chance to flee using the sewers. Yeah, wait, so he's been using the sewers for his getaways. Yeah, said so in the report me and Ed shot made. Iola, he must smell awful. Peter cringed before he coughed. So, you know his fighting style, or should I recant from the news articles throughout the day? Peter inquired, to which Izuku shook his head. Stain has a quirk that allows him to paralyze whoever he cuts. When he licks or consumes blood, the victim is paralyzed and can work on multiple people. If he hits one of us, it's game over. Peter turned towards the hotel, as did Izuku. If you get hit, holler and I'll bail you out. I know you'll do the same for me. Of course, Vidoria gulped, gathering his courage as one for all was channeled throughout his body. Yes, he could feel it. The rush of 8% now instantaneously, whereas before at the sports festival he had to focus to bring forth 5%. Okay, Karen's given me a map of the layout. He's on the second floor, maternity ward close to the central rotunda. You go high, I go low. Pincer attack. We ambush him. Izuku said as he got his phone out and dialed an Ed Shots agency. He's a hit-and-run fighter, yet against Musha he couldn't handle sudden surprises. The two heroes in training stood up as one on the roof of the skyscraper and turned. One in green, the other in red and blue, the crescent moon at their backs. Okay then. Operation Stain Hunt is a go. He checked his wrists, and Deku heard clicking noises as he saw small tubes in motion as Spider-Man's fingers flexed into his palms. Let's get that Sanu Vabich. From two buildings away, in the shadow of a skyscraper, Edshot couldn't help but smile. They were moving into position. Whatever device that was held within the young Spider-Man suit was making quick work of what would have been rather dangerous scouting. Even now, they confirmed the footage, hammering out a workable plan. Izuku was a bright boy and from what he was able to gather from the files released after the sports festival. Parker was smart in his own right. He tapped his communicator, running through the list of names before he entered a particular frequency. For most that had this frequency, they would have been sent to voicemail. Thankfully, being in the top 10 had its perks. Headshot, came the tired, irate voice of Mirko. Do you have any idea what time it is? 1237. The ninja answered with far too much cheer in his tone. Oh for the love of if you don't tell me what the fuck you called me for, I'm blocking your number Kamahara. But you love me too much to hang up on me, use a Jiyama chan He teased, and decided, rather quickly, to push through to the point before she did hang up on him. She wouldn't pick up again once she did. You happen to be overseeing the student with the hero name of Spider-Man, right? Yeah, Mirko answered, suddenly more alert and awake, what about him? He's currently in Akuto, Ed Shot made sure that his voice sounded extra peppy. Like a far too happy stewardess on a flight, swinging around the edge of a hospital about to attack the hero killer. With my student too no less. Ah, youth these days. Stone silence answered him. For a second, Ed Shot wondered if she even heard him. Then, something cracked on the other end of the line. I'm sorry, I think my ear infection is kicking in. Could you repeat that? Oh, he knew that tone of voice. Glad it wasn't him. 
He's an acuto he repeated, completely unrepentant. Going after the hero killer. If you follow my transponder, you should. Bullshit. He heard the sound of movement on the other end, walking and then one door being opened. Then another. There was a sudden, very primal, very loud howl at the other end of the line that drilled straight into his ear. He hung up. Quickly, message delivered. Edshot smiled to himself, before quietly continuing his efforts in trailing the two lawbreakers. In the distance, Izuku set up right outside an open window, entering the derelict hospital. Hum, the boys called the police but best to add a little to that urgency. This is Edshot. I'm calling in a villain sighting for the police of Akuto. Converge on my signal. The sound of the alarm shocked him awake, and despite the disorientation, Katsuki surged out of bed as fast as he could, turning on the light in his room. He had his tank top and workout shorts on for PJs as he opened the door. Across from him, Tsunotori was in her American-themed trousers and long shirt, eyes so wide that she looked like she'd been slapped. Up and Adam you too, a psychic said while running past. Got a fire close by. We're the closest so move move move. He turned back, seeing that Tsunotori had already closed the door. Gritting his teeth, the ash blonde turned around and closed his own door, rushing to get dressed. His pajamas were shed, slipping into his custom pants, then his skin-tight vest, his combat trousers, his boots, and finally his arm guards and grenade gauntlets followed suit. Putting on the domino mask, Katsuki stepped back out, seeing Tsunotori running down the hall in her skin-tight orange and padded costume. He ran out, exiting the living quarters and eventually entering the garage where he could see psychics and technicians at work. He stopped by the blonde girl's side, ready for action. Orca barked out orders, guiding everyone by a custom transport with a black and white color palette. Let's move it. Tsunotori, back you go. He said, eyeing the two youngsters. Sit in the back with me. He gestured, and Katsuki followed the girl who moved on instinct. He got in, buckling up as did Tsunotori, the other in turn having what could be described as her game face on. One last bandage draped over his wounds, stain cinched it tight. That would be all that he needed for now. Picking up the makeshift bag of supplies, he rolled his shoulders. All right, he uttered to himself, his only source of light from the candles he'd lit and from the moon's light coming in from the planked up windows. He inspected the map, tapping on the spot. Mount Fuji would be a good spot to heal for a while. From there, a new hunting ground could be chosen. He walked over, grabbing his backup katana as he unsheathed it. It was custom, not possessing the jagged cuts his older one had. Nevertheless, it had served him well before. Stain felt a twinge of sentimentality upon placing his hand on the tattered and decaying bed. Akuto was his home after all, and this was the maternity ward. He shouldered his pack when for a moment, all the light from the window went out. What came next was a crash, and Stain's katana broke under a high-speed kick. The sheathed blade shielded him from the impact as he yelled, his body flying through the plaster and walls, finally slamming into the hallway floor outside. He coughed out blood, feeling a cut from his sword from where it broke through its sheath as he lifted his head up. There in his room, hand on the floor was an individual in blue and red, eyes glowing in the dark in a narrowed blue hue. Stain roared, pulling his broken sword from the sheath as he prepared to charge. S-M-A-A-S-H. Only for a fist to collide with his face, with all the force of a sledgehammer as Stain would been sent flying had it not been for something latching onto his boot, and was instead tugged violently the other way. With a strangled yell, the hero killer was flung down the other end back to his assailants as he was slammed downwards. He recovered, gargling as he swung his sword, his eyes tracking some figure making distance in the dark hallway. He could see him, a kid shrouded in emerald lightning, only for his sword to be yanked away. On instinct, he went for his combat knife as he turned towards the charging blue-eyed attacker. The hero killer roared like an animal, swiping and slashing with blinding speed. Yet each time, Blue Eyes dodged like an expert boxer, almost as if he knew what was coming. And like a boxer, the counterpunch came and knocked the wind out of him, a hand lashing out and latching around his wrists. He yelled in agony, dropping the knife as he heard bones creak. Then he felt a kick to his leg as he fell to his knees. A white string quickly glued his boot to the floor. He caught a flash, emerald lightning leaping from the second attacker's body as he rushed in. Fast, almost as fast as Stain himself. Blue Eyes was closer, so Stain grabbed at the ground, grasping a bedpan in his hand before swinging. Blue Eyes battered it aside, and Stain saw the pan buckle and cave in. Obviously a strength quirk. He was open. He moved his arm to block Green, only for Blue to grab at his wrist, pulling it and his whole arm out of the way. Green's fist came in with a straight kidney shot, the full weight of his blow sending bolts of pain across Stain's whole body. He was lifted off the ground, the white goop snapping where it clung to his boot, tiles shattering under them. 
However, Blue still had a hold of his arm. He was stopped, Blue yanking him back and the freshly dislocated arm dislocated again with fire spreading across his joint. Blue let him go, spinning in midair to kick Stain across the stomach before he could hit the ground. The hero killer's body was airborne once again, slamming into the wall but he rallied, fighting through the pain. With gritted teeth and rage fueling him as he fumbled for a weapon, something caught the light as it sailed through the air, a food tray. By the time his brain even consciously recognized the item it was too late, the metal tray cracking across the ridge of his eye socket, roaring in agony before Green was on top of him again. He threw out his shuriken, but no hits as Green Lightning punched him, kicking him as Stain did his best not to fall. He tried to call upon another knife on his holster, only for some white string to latch onto it and rip it from his hand. Why why Stain was cut off with a punch to the face when he tried to stand. Blue joined the fray, and the situation devolved into a blur of pain. Blow after blow rocked his body, with punches and kicks landing in alternating turns. The world swam, and for a moment, caught between the fugue of consciousness and the dark of oblivion, Akaguro Chizom wondered if he was going to die. Then, it was over. One of them punched him, he wasn't sure which, smashing him clear through old drywall at his back and Stain fell into the hallway further still. He crashed against the guard railing, going through it as he was sent tumbling down onto the central rotunda, landing in the empty fountain with a crash. He didn't get back up. The inferno was bright as Katsuki exited the transport, walking out and seeing the fire. It was monstrous, consuming the apartment complex as firefighters were hard at work firing their hoses at it. What do we do? Tsunotori asked as the sidekick spread out and Orca stepped out, glaring at the conflagration. Secure the perimeter. Katsuki looked around, seeing some ambulances and people coughing, crying. Some stared out into space, numb and cold. Is there anyone else inside? Orca yelled. Someone came up. A bulky rhino-looking woman. Third and fourth floors couldn't get out. Rescueman. Orca called. Already on it. A fireman screamed. Behind him, almost like clockwork a group of three firefighters charged forward, three of them in an almost tripod formation with a ladder between them. Two of them put it into position, while the third climbed the steps of the ladder even as the metal structure leaned forward against the edge of a window. Without hesitation, the firemen secured the clamps on the windowsill. Back you go, Orca barked, snapping the bomber out of his stupor, support the firemen, get the water up there. On it, Katsuki called with more confidence than he felt. He rushed forwards, and a fireman, an older man with a look of hardened intensity that only came from years of experience looked him over for almost a second before coming to a decision. Experienced hands strapped the end of a hose to a nearby hydrant, while the other held it out to Katsuki. Take the end, feed it up the ladder and when I call go, hold on for dear life. The firefighter ordered. Katsuki nodded once, taking the offered hose and moving as fast as his legs could take him. Even from where he was, the heat was making him sweat buckets. On any other day, he would have loved this situation. All he needed was a twitch, and he could blow the entire building sky high. But that wasn't what was needed. He needed to move, to carry, to hand off the hose, which was exactly what he did. As instructed, the second that the firefighter took the end, he helped the one man that wasn't helping secure the ladder and fed the hose up. In the corner of his eye, Katsuki was vaguely aware of Orca standing next to some of the workers. They were overlooking a map, a blueprint to the building maybe. Another group of men, with the help of Tsunotori, beat down a door with her horns and axes. The second it was broken down, two men rushed in. The fire drowned out the sound of their screams for help, but a few moments later, the men came out while holding civilians. A few others running out behind them were pulled along by Tsunotori's horns which they were holding onto for dear life as they coughed and choked on the smoke. Water incoming. The older man screamed, and Katsuki felt the rush of water run through the hose. Above him, the fireman buckled slightly before unleashing the stream into the open flames, no doubt giving some of the men away in should they need it. Sure enough, the man on top stepped in hose at the ready and letting the other firefighters follow. There was a distant sound of screaming. The older fireman tapped Katsuki's shoulder. Get ready to help them down, he ordered, taking Katsuki's place on the hose. The young intern's head nodded robotically. When the firefighter returned, he was carrying a woman. Gently as he could, he shifted her to another fireman who in turn handed her off to Katsuki. When he got her, he shifted his stance as best he could to compensate for the weight. He needn't have bothered, as Tsunotori was right there, ready with a team of responders and a stretcher. Quickly, but gently as he could, Katsuki laid the woman down on the cot. The Texan girl gave him the barest of looks before helping the responder wheel the woman to the nearest ambulance. Katsuki wiped off his brow, sweat forming due to him being this close to the fire. 
It only increased as he turned around to find yet another person in need of carrying, a boy this time. He repeated the same motions for the woman, and Tsunotori was there. After that, time started to blur. Katsuki might have gotten maybe 30 seconds, a minute tops between each delivery. And every time that he turned around, Tsunotori was there, tiredness forming on her as she kept going back and forth. Grab, hand off, take a breath, grab, hand off, take a breath, repeat. It happened a dozen, two dozen, fuck Katsuki didn't know how many times. He moved purely via muscle memory at some point, his body only remaining functional because of its natural resistance to heat. Then suddenly, the stream of people stopped. Katsuki blinked and was suddenly aware of how numb his arms felt. The fireman above him tapped him on the shoulder and the ash blonde took that as his cue to come down. Every fiber of muscle in his arms felt like razor blades. His ribs and chest felt like they were on fire and his throat scratched and itched. When he coughed he didn't stop, eyes watering at the sudden rush of colder air as he clutched at his chest. One of the firemen approached, water bottle in hand. Katsuki moved to take it from him only for the guy to force his hand away, making Katsuki cup it before placing just the smallest bit of water in his hand. He drank, and was grateful immediately that the guy had kept the water from him. His coughing was renewed tenfold, relief warring with pain across his throat and voice box. His legs were shaking. When the fuck did that happen? Finally, he had enough presence of mind to look up, noticing that the ambulances and flashing lights were everywhere. Hitsunotori pony laying flat on her back on the asphalt, covered in soot and breathing hard. Gang Orca was kneeling further away, near their truck, where some of the sidekicks hosed him down with all the water they could spare. Even from here he could see that the man's skin was dry and beginning to blister. Had he gone into that building? There's a family on the upper floor. Someone suddenly shouted, and suddenly, the urgency was back. The firefighters were moving again, rushing forward as several of them put their fireproof gear back on and threw themselves back into the inferno. Katsuki turned, staring up at the flames where there was indeed someone still at the topmost floor. The building creaked dangerously, a blast from a ruptured gas line throwing him back and the firemen were forced out as the inferno surged. There was a cacophony of voices, shouted orders, demands he could barely make sense of. I need a ladder over here. The fire chief yelled. It's not gonna hold. Then, there was a rush of air above him and his eyes shifted in time to see Pony rush straight into the air, riding her two horns upwards. Tsunotori. Gang Orca shouted. She either didn't hear him or she ignored him. The red-eyed boy could see her struggling to get close through the heat of the flames, probing for an opening. Katsuki saw her perk up, and she dove right in. Fucking moron. It wasn't until he was halfway up the damn building himself, blasts surging out of his palms that he recognized the shout as being his, red eyes peering into the flames, scanning for her. Then she was flying right out, two people in her arms as she floated down with a wobble. Her landing was less than graceful, and the kid that hit the ground with her couldn't be more than three or four years their junior. He impacted the ground next to her with a crash as the paramedics rushed forward. She tried to get her feet back under her, but she was on her last legs. Her eyes were dizzy, her vision swimming. Stay down. He grunted. You got him out. She shook her head, and between her hacking coughs she managed to speak again. His sister's still up there. Katsuki felt his eyes trail back to the building. He heard her coughing and he almost missed her trying to rise again on her horns. Back you go, Tsunotori. That's enough. Get over here, yelled a voice. It was Orca. Fucking he almost punched her. He settled for breaking the horns under her feet instead. She hit the ground with a scream. Back you go, Orca added. Stay the fuck here. The blast that rushed him up the side of the building made his bones ache, the muscles in his shoulders cramping. He could feel the blood pumping through his ears with the roar and crackling of the fire. He saw where she entered before and rushed straight in. The heat hit him like an iron sledgehammer. It was overpowering, all-consuming, and he swore that he was going to black out instantly before he grit his teeth and pushed through. The apartment was small, and the paper-thin walls were an immense help. The girl was crying. He heard her long before he saw her, following the sound of her voice. The door was burning by the time he reached it. Get away from the door. He shouted as loud as he could before raising both arms straight up. The blast rocked him back on his heels and he felt like his bones were breaking. The door was blasted to a million splinters as he heard the girl scream. Good, if she was screaming then it meant she was alive. He moved in, and there she was huddled under her bed. She was whimpering and crying, soot marked tear streaks trailing down her face. She looked at him with open fear, but the second she registered who he was, she rushed out from under her bed, bare feet pounding against the floor before she jumped right on him. 
Katsuki grabbed onto her, teeth clenched as he turned around again, only to see his exit area be swallowed by flames. He sucked down a breath and the memory of the cold sip of water he'd drank just a minute ago hit him, making him want to cough again. He needed his arms free. Get on my back, he demanded, the girl clinging to him for dear life, not seeming to register the request. He reached behind him, forcing her arms apart as she cried before he pulled her away, bodily manhandling her until she was riding him on piggyback. From there she got the message, arms wrapping around his neck and hugging him tight. The flames continued to crackle and surge. He knew how fire worked. It was something you had to know with a quirk like his. He needed something. Needed. Something. His eyes found the bed. That would do. He marched over, leaning down and flipping the mattress clear and out, propping it up. He was grateful that it was a bed for a kid and not anything bigger. It was awkward enough as it was. He propped the bed up with one arm, his back to the wall, bed between him and the flames. East side, nothing but empty street on the other side. Hang on. He held out his remaining free arm and unleashed a shout and a blast that left his ears ringing. The wall, like the door before it, was blasted wide open. The fire surge was immediate, the flames rushing towards the fresh oxygen, devouring it and the blast of heat slammed straight into the mattress. The concussive force made his arm buckle, slamming straight into him and shoving him out of the building into the open night air. He heard the girl whimper, hugging him tighter. He grit his teeth. It's fine. He snarled, and he wondered if she could even hear him past the rushing flames and wind. You're gonna be fine. I'm right here. His fingers twitched. The blast that escaped him was powerful enough to arrest his movement completely. Car alarms going off far beneath him and his scream was half pain and half defiance as he hovered above the city streets, taking flight under the night sky as Katsuki roared. You sure that's enough to hold him? Izuku asked. Oh yeah, Parker said, letting an empty web cartridge fall to the ground from his wrists. Unless he's got something like All Might's super strength, he's got no leverage in there. By the way, I saw that Captain America move with the tray. Classy, Izuku turned, confused, but after a moment he realized that he was being complimented. Who? Thank you. Who or what was Captain America? He got the feeling that Parker was smiling behind his mask. The eyes kinda gave him away. Izuku nodded, only to frown slightly at what was going to serve as the hero killer's transport for now. To put it bluntly, Parker was going a little bit too deep into the spider theme for his tastes. With the exception of the villain's head, everything was covered in the white, web-like substance that Parker had been using up until this point. He hung from a single string, while the rest of his body was covered in so much webbing that the villain's body didn't have any definition. All in all, he looked like a huge white egg with an angry face at the top. Also I really, really don't want him to get the chance to swing one of these anymore, Parker said, picking up one of the broken blades, like, they're so cool but I really don't want anyone using them. Izuku nodded in agreement, glancing down at all the different implements of deadly force that they'd found on the hero killer. Knives, shuriken, and a dozen different variants on a combat knife. It was frankly ridiculous to hold all these tools on one's person. Why you think we should break them? Izuku asked. He got the sense that Parker's features scrunched together behind his mask. I mean, sure, not like we're going to use them, but aren't they like, evidence or something? W we have the hero killer, Izuku pointed out. Fair point, dibs on the katana. He reached out, only for his fingers to freeze at a sound, like a crack in the air. Then came a clap. The two students turned as one, and Izuku felt his entire life flash before his eyes as Ed shot walked out from the darkness, clapping his hands. The hero's single eye was dead set on the two boys, but he looked like he was, smiling. What? Hello and good evening my cute little intern. Ed shot sang, I knew that you enjoyed a jog at the end of the night, but this seems rather excessive, don't you think? Or would it be morning instead? It is after midnight, after all. Izuku blinked and Parker's head snapped around, flashing between looking at a pale Izuku and the hero. I'm sorry, but does this mean that we just took the hero killer down in front of a ninja? I prefer the term shinobi, Edshot corrected. But essentially, yes. You indeed went after a villain without the supervision of either of your mentors, and engaged your quirks without having your provisional licenses. Izuku paled till he looked more like a ghost, and from the way that Parker seemed to freeze as well, he had come to the same conclusion as him. They had been caught breaking the law, in front of one of the top ten heroes no less. Oh no, All Might was going to kill him. His mother was going to kill him. 
The green-haired boy gulped, stealing himself. W. We did the right thing, Izuku said, surprising himself as much as the two others. Harkers snapped back to look at him so fast that Izuku wouldn't have been surprised if the guy had whiplash. Ed shot on the other hand, simply raised his single visible eye and crossed his arms. We knew that Stain was here and he was going to leave for another safe house somewhere to hide immediately. Izuku continued before his nerves could get the better of him. We had the chance to take him in and prevent any more attacks, so we took it. The consequences don't matter, not after we've confirmed that he won't be able to hurt anyone anymore. And we gave justice to everyone that this guy hurt and killed, Parker added, nodding his support to Izuku as he stood beside him. Izuku was grateful for the acceptance, but that feeling was soon overtaken by worry as Ed shot stepped forwards. The shinobi hero walked straight by them, and next to the cocoon form of stain, he tapped the white substance with a gloved finger before stroking his chin. How long will this webbing last? Ed shot asked, turning towards the red and blue costumed American. Um, Parker said, caught off guard slightly, about couple hours or so. Ed shot stared at him and Izuku, his single visible eye clouded with a thousand thoughts that Izuku couldn't read. Then it closed, and he clapped. Well then, I'd say that you two accomplished quite the feat. Dot 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 what? So, we're not in trouble? Izuku asked. Ed shot scoffed. Oh no, you're definitely still in trouble. If it were anyone else standing here this conversation wouldn't be happening. You'd be on your way to a jail cell next to angry emoji here. A certain canine chief I know in Hasu would love to have you two crucified and behind bars for sure. Then he stopped and smiled. Since it's me though, I think things will turn out a bit differently. So, we're good, right? Parker asked, fidgeting. For a given value of good, yes you are. What does that mean? Well, I was shadowing Izuku here to see how he would respond to tracking down the hero killer when he's faced with obstacles before him. I never imagined that he would have helped. He said, turning towards Parker. Well, the data came from your agency in regards to Stain's location. I found it, and took it. Yes, but, if I recall, you're under her supervision, yes. Did Marco San approve? He asked, dragging out the last word as he leaned forward. His arms crossed and I quirked in amusement. As if on cue, the door at the other end of the hall burst open, the door disintegrating into splinters as planks and pieces splattered across the ground, Parker letting out a shriek of surprise. A second passed before the tan skin and folded rabbit ears of an enraged Mirko stepped through. Holy crap, another top ten hero wait, was Parker shaking. She looked down the hallway, and Izuku swore that he saw her eyes widen and glow red. And her eyes were already red. Oh no, Parker wheezed in English. Her expression was thunderous. If looks could kill, and some could, everything in a ten-mile radius would likely be dead. It made Kakan's murderous glare look cute and cuddly. Oh dear, she's far angrier than I thought. Ed Shot's voice seemed to finally lose its mostly amused inflection. Mirko started forward, and halfway through the distance Ed Shot stepped between her and Parker in what Izuku could only take as one of the bravest things he'd ever seen. A hurricane wouldn't have wanted to get in front of that woman. Move, Kamahara. She snarled, baring her teeth. Parker seemed to be shrinking on the spot, paralyzed in fear. Ed Shot shook his head. Nope. I know that look, Yuzajiyama. She moved to step around him only for her way to be blocked again. His speed matching hers, dust being scattered from their blink of an eye movements. Izuku very well thought he was about to see two top ten heroes fight, and not in a friendly way. Should he speak? He tried to find words, but couldn't get them out of his throat. You're about to do something that you're gonna end up regretting, Mirko san Ed shot warned. He jerked his head. Go for a walk. Cool your head. She didn't look inclined to accept. When the flash and blaring of police sirens pierced the gloom much to Izuku's gratitude, some clarity seemed to pierce through the haze of anger and she turned, marching out of the rotunda grounds to do as Ed shot asked. She paused, shooting a harsh glare at the boy behind the ninja hero before she kicked a statue, sending it flying out of the hospital. The very act made Parker jump as she stomped away. Izuku saw the shinobi hero relax minutely. When he turned back to them he was smiling again. I'm rather impressed, I don't think I've ever seen her this mad before. Nice work. He added with a thumbs up. Parker shuffled from foot to foot, eyes fixed on the floor. The sirens were drawing closer. All right kids. The hero drawled as the sound of car doors opening and closing reached their ears. His playfulness was gone, and there was the calm and collected shinobi who was a top 10 pro in the country. If you would like to keep that given value of good status, follow my lead. Peter followed the group out of the hospital, dragging the webbed-up serial killer behind him. Izuku was by his side. 
he took a deep breath, standing up straight as he saw a Kudo police officer's approach. The head of the group was a small-looking toad man of sorts. He had a similar badge and beige coat that Mr. Fukuda wore too. Their police chief, Chief Akiyama, glad to see you made it, Edshot said with a pep in his step as he shook the dwarf's hand. At this hour, the villain you've gotten better be worth it. He grumbled, his voice gravely. Would the hero killer stain suffice? He said, stepping aside as the groaning black-haired man in webbing was dumped at his feet. The chief's eyes rose up in surprise as other officers came to collect the murderer. Behind the cars, Peter could make out some sleepy-eyed people with their cameras and shouting for an interview. The media, at this hour, how did you find him? He asked, before noticing the youths behind him. Well, suffice to say but I am proud to announce that our capturing of Stain here was a collaboration between the Edge Shot and Mirko Hero Agencies. For you see, we have been hard at work over these last few days aiming to track Stain down. Edge Shot explained. The chief raised an eyebrow as another officer got out a special phone. Must have a recorder or audio logger. Care to explain? He asked. This does seem rather sudden. And where is Mirko? Checking the area, Edge Shot answered easily, smiling, still has a bit of excess energy after the fight. Peter bit his lip, forcing a lump down his throat. The two cops shared a look and shrugged. I'll have to say, Mirko San and her intern Spider-Man here, Ed Shot gestured to Peter and Mirko, have been patrolling all over Tokyo as I'm sure you are aware. In fact, what they have been doing has been scouting for potential safe houses where Stain could hide away after his attacks. Isn't that right, Spider-Man? His eyes were on him. Peter stiffened, ah, why yeah, we were, smooth. Many of the precincts and the wards figured that as well in how Stain has been eluding us, but we couldn't come up with anything. How did you find him now? Akiyama inquired with crossed arms. Hasu largely, Ed Shot continued. After Stain killed Native, it offered us a clue on how he got around. How would anyone escape the likes of the number two hero endeavor anyway? He is a known bloodhound for crime and an expert detective when it comes to deduction and reasoning. Deku here, he gestured to Midoriya who peeked up, came up with the beautiful assumption that Stain had been using the sewers to move about, utilizing the refineries here in Tokyo. He pointed behind him, to where the domed refinery was. He was using the tunnels, employing these buildings as essentially checkpoints. Midoriya was blushing, smiling awkwardly. The chief made a face, looking irritated, the public works committee is not gonna like this. Akiyama mused. Well, it can't be helped. They'll just have to use more of their budget to install cameras or security drones in the sewers. Our tax money hard at work. The ninja hero jested. Anyway, we were able to confirm Stain's location when we came here, as it was the most reasonable refinery to reach from Hasu. Just in case, I called in Mirko San for backup, and she and her intern answered and did the bulk of the fighting. And so, here we are. Hmm, it's good enough I suppose. I'll need you to confirm it down at the station with us. Akiyama shrugged. Gotta make a report, regardless. Damn, you all. Came a weak voice as everyone turned to the source, and saw a panting, gap-toothed bloody nose stain hanging his head out the car window. My, crusade. It wasn't supposed to end like. This, the playful air the ninja hero had vanished in an instant. Save your breath. Headshot spoke, his tone low. Get them out of here. Akiyama roared, pointing at the few night owls of the media as some officers aimed to push them away. No, seriously, the two journalists were owl people. Silence, you fraud. Stain roared, his red eyes blazing, saliva spitting. The only one who was supposed to defeat me was All Might and he alone. He is the one true hero. You, all of you, are nothing but greedy fakes. Only in it for glory and profit. Not for true altruism. Peter narrowed his eyes. I will seek vengeance. I will break these chains you imposed upon me. I will make this world blue and righteous from the stain you all have ruag. He was cut off, a web blob over his mouth as he muffled out screams, struggling in his web cocoon. Peter had his arm raised, and eyes meeting the killers after he fired. Shut up. Ah, bless silence, thank you, Spider-Man. Edshot said with a smile. Okay, lock him up boys. Akiyama gestured as the cops rolled up the windows despite a struggling and furious stain writhing in the car. Let's go get that report filed, and we can get some much-needed sleep. Akiyama grumbled. Peter saw Izuku walk with Ed Shot to the cop cars to head over to the station. The fire was finally dying away. The flames had raged almost the whole night, swallowing the building whole. They'd managed to prevent its spread to adjacent buildings but nothing would salvage this one. 
Gang Orca turned. Eyeing Bakugo and Tsunotori where the two sat with their paramedics, breathing deeply from their oxygen masks. He can see the girl being reunited with her parents, being loaded into the last ambulance as they cried together. Kuga wasn't sure if he should applaud their bravery or berate them for their recklessness. He took a breath. No doubt other agencies didn't have nearly as much trouble with their interns. Peter didn't so much wake the following morning, but rather he decided that this was a good enough time to keep his eyes open. He hadn't slept last night, body still thrumming with energy in the impending argument with Mirko looming over him. The rabbit heroine hadn't been angry last night, she'd been absolutely furious. He doubted the handful of hours between last night and now had been enough to calm her down. He contemplated staying in bed a while longer, but decided against it. Delaying things might just piss her off more and the sooner it was over with. Well, the sooner it would be over. Pulling himself out of bed, he moved to the nearby bathroom to brush his teeth and change out of his sleep clothes. The sun was up and the day was bright and shiny and beautiful. The total opposite of the storm brewing in his chest. Finally, willing himself to not find any more excuses he took a breath and opened up the door to the hallway. The door to Mirko's room was open, it was empty and he wondered if she was still out patrolling, or venting might be more accurate. He started to walk down the hallway, not daring to make a sound. He saw the light from the theater room glowing. Peering into the slightly open door he found the stark white of her hair just peeking over the edge of the couch. He took a deep breath, no doubt she'd heard him a long time ago and already knew he was there. He stepped forward into the room. She didn't say anything and he wasn't sure how exactly to start the conversation without sticking his foot in his mouth. So he sat down on the other side of the couch and waited. Seconds felt like minutes with this much tension. Or maybe minutes felt like seconds but either way it felt like a long time before she spoke and not nearly long enough. People always ask why I hate having teammates, Mirko said. She didn't shout or yell, she didn't breathe it like a whisper. Her voice was banded steel, with fire in the undertone. Peter cringed. He would have preferred roaring anger. Leech is taking the glory for the hard work of others. Anchors weighing others down from getting things done. She took a deep, slow breath. But shit like this. She turned. Her ruby eyes like spearheads as she pierced Peter with her gaze. Is why I fucking hate teammates. That. Stung. I'm. I'm sorry. She snorted. That makes it all better now. You say that you're sorry and all's forgiven. I know. He ran his hands through his hair. A frustrated helplessness stirring in his gut. He wanted to make this right, like he always tried to make things right but he wasn't sure how in this case. He saw her shake her head. Her ears were folded behind her head as she turned away from him. You ain't fucking sorry for shit. Yes I. She cut him off, a single finger rising and held up between them to demand his silence. Tell me straight up, right now, no bullshit and all's forgiven if you say no. Rewind back to last night, would you still go to that hospital? His protest died on his tongue. Her sneer was an ugly thing. Her ruby eyes like daggers as she bared her teeth. You're fucking sorry you got caught. You're not sorry for what you fucking did. Now his anger simmered, stoked. What I did was make sure a murderer isn't out there to keep on killing people. You are willing to ignore it. Her eyebrows rose, head bobbing in a mockery of a nod. Oh, is that what you did? My mistake then. Shoulda figured having your head so far up your own high and mighty ass makes it so easy to ignore everything else in the world than the shit you choose to smell. The hell is your problem? He growled. He killed people. He would have kept on killing people. If you didn't stop him and you could you may as. Oh, come the fuck off your high horse. Mirko roared, eyes bulging in anger. What you did last night wasn't for anyone other than yourself. To make you feel better. To jack off your little ego. You think I don't fucking see it, huh? She reached for the control beside her pressing the button and there he was, facing down a stunned back Hugo. His face a rictus of animalistic rage as All Might was paused just entering frame, about to intercept. He was sick and tired of looking at this goddamn video. He insults them, you fly off the handle. Classmate gets hurt and if you don't do something you are responsible for what comes after, right? Her voice was a growl. To hell with everything else. Never mind the consequences. Gotta go and make the world right again or whatever. Move or I make you move or whatever bullshit. Sitting around doing nothing doesn't help anyone. He insisted. Why couldn't she understand that? She looked to him, red eyes gleaming like blood rubies in the darkened room. Slowly, she shook her head. And that's why I hate fucking teammates. Their actions and results bring the hole down when things go south. She breathed as she stood, glaring down at him, ears still folded as she crossed her arms over her large chest. Because guess who that's on when you get killed? 
like a blade slicing through the canvas, all the wind was taken right out of his sails. Suddenly Peter felt cold, feeling a phantom pain in his arms before finding the disappointed eyes of Mr. Stark reflected in Mirko's red ones. She looked at him, turning to face him completely in the little ember of anger that had been his sole defense wilted under her stare. We would have lost everything, she said, and for a moment, it confused him. Everything I've built, my life, my reputation, my good name, Shizun's job, the security of this district. I would have plummeted out of the top ten. We would have lost everything, all while I was sleeping in my bed thinking everything was fine. Because you did the one thing I told you not to do. I, I didn't die, Peter retorted weakly. It seemed like a very feeble excuse. I, I would have come back to bed, nothing else after. It was. No, she answered, her tone softer but firm. But the thought never even crossed your mind, did it? Because somewhere deep inside you stopped giving a shit if you actually do die. And if it doesn't matter to you, it shouldn't matter to anyone else, right? That wasn't true. He remembered dying. He remembered the fear, the desperation, the confusion. He remembered his body slipping away, everything going dark. He remembered and he suddenly felt sick as a thought came unbidden, flickering through his mind with a nauseating calm. It had just been like going to sleep. He felt a tingle at the back of his mouth like he wanted to throw up. Hey I don't wanna die. He affirmed weakly in English, even as he looked down to the ground. I did not say you wanted to. I said you do not care. She countered in accented English. There was a silence between them, heavy with unspoken words. We did the right thing. He insisted in Japanese. She nodded. Yeah, for all the wrong reasons. Mirko straightened as she stood up. Those wrong reasons, sooner or later are gonna get you or those close to you killed, and I ain't gonna be responsible for that. He looked at her. Her features were still hard, disapproval in her eyes but there was also a naked concern beneath the layers. A hint of sadness. She let out a sigh sad, the anger dissipating out of her as she walked back to her side of the couch, sitting down. Your internship is over. She said softly what they'd both figured before he'd even walked into the room. Thanks to Ed Shot's story, spin it as a reward for taking down the hero killer. I can't say any different any more than you can. But I hope that you remember this as an intervention or a lesson, not a win, weak as it might be. Pack up your stuff, go home. I, I don't want to leave you on a bad note. He half stated, half pleaded. It was true. Behind the brusqueness, behind the anger and the dismissiveness. He did respect her. He even liked her to some degree. Her head tilted, her red eyes hard. But he could see the sadness there. Neither did I. The soft admission cut him down to the bone. What came next was worse. But like you said, if you can do something and don't, what comes after is on you. She turned away, turning on the film in the theater to a news report as her ears remained folded, not even giving him a second glance. Peter left the theater, and he was out of the agency within two minutes, dressed in bags in hand. <laughs> Izuku sighed quietly. The afternoon sun was hot and for some reason, Ed Shot was choosing to walk down the sidewalk, as opposed to the rooftops. People gawked and waved, some were brave enough to ask for autographs, even Izuku himself had been asked to take a picture or two with news about the hero killer's capture and his involvement in it much to his complete embarrassment. He followed as obediently and as quietly as he could, but he was relieved when they lost the crowds and marched into a nearby park. Edshot smiled, letting out a happy sigh as he sat down on a park bench, patting the spot beside him. Izuku sat down next to him without protest. The pro hero seemed more than content to sit back and people watch, but Izuku finally found the courage to give voice to something that had been niggling in the back of his mind since the announcement last night. All Ed shot in. Hem, the ninja's head tilted towards him, making a show of leaning his ear slightly closer. Ah, uh, well, I just want to ask her, why aren't you angry? Would you prefer I be? Hey, oh ooh, no, no no, no 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 no. Izuku rapidly answered before he realized that he was being teased. Again, it's just he continued. Marco-san was furious and I'd understand if you were too. I mean, well, Edshot took a deep, slow breath. To be honest little intern, there are two trains of thought here. Yes, you would have committed a rather egregious breach of the trust I placed in you, but that's somewhat mitigated because I rather expected what you did. It doesn't really help your intent but at the very least it doesn't catch me off guard, which I think helped fuel Mirko's anger. He shook his head. Back on track, yes you did something wrong, but I'm choosing to overlook it, because I think you did it for the right reasons. But it was still something that could have hurt your agency, and you if something. Edshot nodded. Yes, that's all true, but the underlying fact is you chose Midori no Deku. His single visible eye turned to the boy. You chose the kind of hero you wanted to be. The green-haired youth remembered the words from Edshot's earlier lessons. You decided that you needed to stand up when you felt no one else would. 
you decided to do what no one else could, and you did it without a single concern or thought for your personal gain or glory, but to do good because it was good. And that reminds me of something we grow closer to losing every day. He said somberly, looking up and away, as if to a faraway place. And this first step you took, and I don't think it should be rewarded with a punishment. Izuku looked down. I'm not sure everyone would agree with you. They won't. He smiled. But let me ask you something. If I'd have turned right back around last night and thrown you and Parker under the bus, no glory, no recognition, no rewards, just punishment and expulsion from my agency and recommendation of it to you, eh? What choice would you have made? Go to the hospital or stay at the hotel? Izuku was ashamed that he had to think about it. But he didn't want to lie. I'd be harder. He admitted, and the admission itself hurt. But I'd like to think I'd still try to do the right thing. And that's enough for me. The shinobi nodded. Then, the man took another deep breath and stood, looking at his smartwatch. Ah oh well, I need to get some water. Izuku moved to stand when Ed Shot's hand gently pressed him back down into the seat. La la. He wagged his finger. I'll come back to get you when it's time to leave. I think it's still necessary for you to stay in the park a little longer. Get some fresh air. We are going to be training hard tomorrow in our stuffy little dojo after all. Izuku blinked at his strange, possibly insane sensei. Um, um okay. Ed Shot smiled. Be back soon. Then he was gone, body folding in on itself and firing off into the sky. Just where the hell was he getting water? Kyushu, Hokkaido. Izuku sat on the bench for a moment, confused towards his sensei's latest antics when he noticed someone to his right marching closer. He looked up and found the unmistakable eyes of Yagi Toshinori looking down at him, with hollowed cheeks and sunken eyes. Izuku felt the beginnings of guilt welling up from his gut at the look in those dark blue orbs. Peter sighed through his nostrils, staring at the mess of security cones and caution tape that surrounded the train station's entrance. Apparently, several Namu rampaging in Hasu tended to mess up rail lines in quite a few places outside of Hasu. There was a sign plastered in front that indicated the next station down the line was open. Bag slung over his shoulder, the ace of class one it didn't feel like anything of the sort right now. His eyes were glued to the floor. Karen was silent in his ear. Mirko's words kept bouncing around in his skull. By and large, while a big part of him didn't, he couldn't think that he'd done the wrong thing. He recognized at the very least that he'd done it the wrong way. Stain had to be taken down, but Mirko was right, if something had happened to him, he would have hurt both her and Nekiri-san. And he hadn't thought to call back up, or even phone the police, not until Izuku was there. He was going to go in there, beat him up, web him up and place him on a busy sidewalk. Just like back home in Queens, he knew why he went after Stain, and he knew it was the right thing to do. But his recklessness, his disregard for taking almost any precautions. Why did he do that? He wasn't suicidal, and he remembered enough of the USJ and Shigaraki to know that he was afraid of dying, at least at that moment, and, well, no need to think further back than that. Was he trying to prove something? Did he just get caught up in the moment? Maybe Karen's voice in his ear made him think he wasn't as alone as he had been. Because somewhere deep inside you stopped giving a shit if you actually do die. And if it doesn't matter to you, it shouldn't matter to anyone else, right? He cringed, stopping mid-step. His shadow stretched long ahead of him as some people marched around and passed him. He forced his mind to grab hold of the statement, pick it apart, measure and weigh her words, think on how true they were. He did care, but he didn't think about it, about the possibility of it. Not anymore. It was easier that way. He kept moving, crossing the street into the park ahead, cut through here to get to the next station. As he walked his thoughts kept turning, moving, replaying the conversation over and over again in his head. Somewhere, long before this, maybe during the first year since he'd arrived in this world, he recognized deep in an untouched, unexplored shoved aside part of his brain, that he wasn't exactly dealing with the whole thing that happened well, that he was less processing and more burying it, keeping busy, keeping his brain occupied, learning Japanese, learning the land, the culture, trying to make friends. He still flinched at the snap of fingers. His night terrors had receded but weren't gone. Sometimes he passed by the hallway in the middle of the night to get a drink and he'd see Aunt May and use pictures, or Mr. Stark in a business suit down the street before he shook his head and reality reasserted itself. He would see some overweight mixed kid as Ned or a slim Tanjaru or punk girl as MJ. Somewhere along the way he found himself leaning against a bench. He wasn't crazy. He wasn't. But this thing, all the mistakes he'd made in handling Stain. Stain was a two-bit ambush murderer. What if next time it wasn't? What if next time he went after someone significantly better, made all the same mistakes, and cost all the people around him everything because he acted stupid? Because he had issues. He closed his eyes. I'm not crazy. A part of him hissed, rebelled, insisted. 
I'm not crazy. He'd done the right thing. What were you thinking? We just wanted to do the right thing. Peter perked up. He recognized that voice. Turning his head, he could just see through the divider brambles and bushes. A familiar mop of green hair, sitting on a bench. There was a skinny, blonde guy in front of Midoriya, with his back to Peter, dressed in loose-fitting clothes. The guy looked downright skeletal. The right thing would have been informing the police, it would have been calling Endeavor, or even me for that matter, not going there yourself. You could have trailed Stain when he was leaving and signaled the authorities. Instead you rushed in and you could have gotten killed. Peter recognized Izuku's wince as his own and the arachnid hero in training felt a twinge of guilt that he'd dragged Midoriya into this kind of trouble. He did confirm Stain's location, and him preparing to leave made them jump the gun. One part of him reminded him, rather firmly, that he was eavesdropping, and it was rude. He certainly wouldn't have wanted anyone to spy on himself and Mirko earlier. This was, private. Another part wondered if this guy would say anything different. Have a perspective Mirko lacked. Was he Izuku's family? An uncle or something? H he had to be stopped eh? Not at that kind of risk. Skeleton dude retorted on the spot. I only tried to do what you would've. You're not me. The man's shout could have woken the dead and Midoriya looked like he'd been stabbed, eyes wide and face pale. The tears Midoriya tried to hold back made Peter's gut twist. You're not me. The man repeated, panting. You can't be me. Every word seemed to dig the knife in deeper and Peter was momentarily torn between leaving this clearly private moment and actually revealing himself and interfering to support Midori somehow. Whoever this guy was, Midori held him in high regard and his words were hurting him. His friend. Then, the blonde man knelt in front of him, hands that seemed far too large on his skeletal frame rising to place themselves on Izuku's shoulders. You need to be better than me, young Midoriya. For far too many times in a single day, Peter felt his heart stop and the disappointed face of Mr. Stark flashed before his eyes. I wanted you to be better. You need to be better, but you won't make it if you get yourself killed before you've come into your power. Stain was dangerous, he's killed multiple heroes and even if you got the drop on him he could have killed you after a single cut. Izuku choked down a sob. You are a hero, right down to your core and that's why I chose you as my successor. And sometimes wanting to do something that seems so right and so obvious can lead people like you and I down the wrong path. It's happened to me many times. I know. The man's solemn voice carried through the air, heavy and sure with the weight of experience. His hand going to his side. They can lead our own stubbornness and sense of justice to make the wrong choices. They can lead us to hurting those closest to us, or losing them. Izuku wiped at his eyes. You need to be better. He repeated. And part of that is not repeating my mistakes. Take what's good in me if anything, not the bad, young Midoriya. For a moment, Izuku looked like he might protest, his chin shaking up and down as he fought back the tears. Then he nodded. Promise me, you won't do something so reckless again, even if he looked creepy and skeletal. His voice was warm as it sounded like he smiled. All right. Another shaky nod. The blonde man pulled Izuku close for a hug and that seemed to be the straw that broke the camel's back as Izuku opened the waterworks, wailing and sobbing. Peter slipped away. He'd intruded enough. Later, his thoughts would return to Izuku, and he would start to wonder who the blonde man was. Takeyama Yu allowed herself to yawn as the elevator to her apartment floor pinged, high heels dangling from her fingers as she tried not to stumble too badly, stepping off the metal box and into the hall. Her date tonight had been a total bore. Dai couldn't find an interesting conversation with a map. Though, if she were being perfectly honest she had been a little distracted by the news going around that Ed shot and Mirko caught the hero killer, and Peter had helped. But that was beside the point. An interesting date would have held her interest. Fumbling for her keys inside her tiny purse, Yu mumbled and tried to organize her swimming thoughts into a vague to-do list for tomorrow. She got through three failed attempts to find the right key and had just managed to get past brushed teeth when the door opened. Even in the fugue of one too many drinks, it took her a second to recognize that there was someone in her living room, sitting on the couch. A familiar someone. Peter smiled and waved. Hey you. And that was all she needed, letting out a squeal of happiness and surprise she moved across the room, leaving the door wide open behind her as Peter stood up to meet her, offering a hug. You're home. She laughed, delighted. I thought you weren't due back for another few days. More than a couple of days actually. Mirko san gave me the rest of the time off. Oh, for helping with Stain, right. She half asked, half stated, smiling as she turned to close the door. Your internship was a lot more exciting than mine when I was your age. Man, the office was just a buzz when they found out this morning. We gotta celebrate. I know the perfect. I'd rather not. Celebrate that is. She stopped, fingers on the door handle. She'd heard that same kind of tone of voice a few times before, 
on other people, even on herself when she had a particularly bad day. She really didn't want to hear it coming from Peter, not after what he'd been through. She turned, closing the door at long last, more quietly than she would have, and took a moment to look at him. There was nothing wrong by outward appearances, but there was still something wrong now that she cared to pay attention. She walked across the room again, worry making her heart stutter as she saw the look on his face. Worry for him, and for herself in a sense, knowing how limited her experience was in things like this. He looked distraught. She reached for and grabbed his hands, moving him back until he was sitting on the couch again. You sat beside him. What's wrong? Talk to me. Peter took a breath, staring at a spot on the wall. I've been sitting here, trying to decide how messed up in the head I might be. Her stomach flopped in her gut. Are your night terrors returning? She asked, blood going cold. Peter shook his head. No, but they might be a part of it. He said, I'm not really sure of a whole lot right now. Blunt was always the best approach. What happened Peter? She shuffled in her seat, giving him her full attention. What happened with Stain? He took a deep breath through his nose, leaning back in his seat. I wouldn't know where to start, or how to, or even if I should, you. Whatever it was, she could see it eating at his insides, and all thoughts of sleep, alcohol or a to-do list were firmly shoved from her mind as she made a decision. Talk to me. I'll sit here all night with you if that's what you need, so you can start from the very beginning. She took his hand, clasping it warmly and tightly. Her voice was firm, and when his eyes turned to her she could see through the faint glimmer of unshed tears and apology. And gratitude. I lived with my aunt and my uncle in New York before I got my powers. During most early mornings, there was a quote that always came to Kamui Woods as he got situated in the agency break room. A hero is a device for turning coffee into salvation. Even back in his training days, he didn't like it too much. It was overselling the importance of coffee to a degree that probably wasn't healthy for anyone involved. That being said, those were the days that he didn't drink the dark liquid, and he didn't have to wake up at 5 in the morning to get ready for his shift. Not a situation that any hero should complain about mind you, early hours and late nights were the unspoken standard. Next to him, the coffee machine chimed, and Camui Woods could at long last take a long sip of the hot beverage. His tiredness remained, but that would change soon enough after getting a few more sips and a lap or two on record. He left the break room, and if he was being perfectly honest, nearly screamed at the sight in front of him. Mount Lady was sitting there, in her hero uniform, at the edge of the mess hall, sipping at a cup of coffee just like he was. He glanced down to the coffee. Did Death Arms spike it without telling him? Shaking out that ridiculous notion, Kamui Woods cleared his throat. Mount Lady didn't even flinch. Mount Lady, Kamui Woods asked. Again, nothing. He sighed. Pew, that apparently got something out of her, given how much she gripped her cup and glanced behind her. She tried to smile casually, waving him over. Haya Shinji, what are you doing here so late? You asks. I have a shift in half an hour, Shinji said, taking a seat next to her. You're the one that's here late. She blinked and looked up at the clock. If there was a light on, Shinji probably would have seen her go as red as some of those boys that followed you around while she was on the clock. Oh, haha, guess I am. She took a sip of her coffee, gagging at the taste. Cold, Shinji guessed. Yeah, she said, pushing the cup away like it was poisoned. I swear that I made it. Oh, never mind. If it were any other situation, Shinji would have rolled his eyes and started down a lecture about his co-worker's behavior. But this wasn't just any other situation. Something wrong, you? He asked. You blinked, the surprise clear on her face. Tired as she was, she couldn't act her way out of a paper bag with how obvious she made it look. I, I don't know what you're. You, Shinji interrupted, voice firm. It's almost 6 in the morning. You don't have a shift until 10 and I wasn't expecting to see you on the field until 11 anyway. But here you are, in costume, all but waiting to go out. He put his cup down and took off his mask. It would only make this awkward. So what's going on? He asked, waiting maybe a minute, watching you as she wrestled with some thoughts, the choice of telling him bouncing around that pretty little head of hers like a pinball machine. Eventually, she sighed, running both of her hands over her face. You ever get hit with a secret that you don't know how to deal with? She asked, like, someone you know has been keeping a secret from you and that secret makes you feel like you've walked in on something big. Shinji couldn't help but frown. I feel like there's a story behind this. You have no idea, you said, taking a long drink of her coffee, apparently not concerned with the taste anymore. She downed it in one go, all but cracking the table as she slammed the cup back down. And that's the worst part. There's nothing that I can say that can make it sound normal. I can barely believe it myself, but it's the truth. She buried her head in her hands. I know it's true, but every sane voice in my head is telling me that it's impossible and I have no idea how to deal with it. Shinji couldn't help but stare. What the hell did you learn? 
The curiosity was building but Shinji kept it in check. He shifted in his seat, his coffee completely forgotten, as was his tiredness. Well, he started, it depends. You pulled her head away from her hands just enough so that Shinji could see her raise an eyebrow. Is this information something that's a crime? You pursed her lips and slowly shook her head in the negative. Not the reaction he would have liked, but at least it was something. And is it something that they've never told anyone else? You didn't say anything, eyes deep in thought. For a few seconds, Shinji thought that she might have fallen asleep. She went very still. Eventually, she nodded. All right, he said. Then I guess that you just need to find a way to deal with it, I suppose. You rolled her eyes. Great advice. Well, you're not giving me much to work with, Shinji said. Not as if we all get great secrets dumped on us every day. But you're supposed to give me some great advice in order to deal with this. You yelled, making Shinji flinch in his seat. She stopped, head meeting the table harder than she probably intended. Sorry, I'm... Going through some stuff, Shinji said, taking another sip, don't worry, I can tell. I'd rather you weren't able to. Shinji rolled his eyes. You, you can't expect answers to just fall into your lap. Life doesn't work like that, especially the life of a hero. Villains were the easy part of the job, worrying about those you protect, keeping your life in check, those were the true challenges. Almost every day Shinji found himself admiring All Might more and more for that reason. For the small amount of time he might spend on patrols, the man no doubt knew exactly how much he could help before he had to return to other matters. If Shinji knew All Might's secret on how to choose those moments, he'd tell you. For now however, and before you get any funny ideas, Shinji continued, you can't just ignore it either. I knew you whined piteously, and she almost sounded like she was about to cry. He gently put a hand on her shoulder, softly urging her to look at him. When she did, he looked as sorry as he could ever be. Look, he said softly, you don't solve problems by pretending they don't exist. But sometimes you don't need to come up with a magic fix either. So just start slow, think how you can help first and find a fix second. You didn't meet his gaze, her entire body shivering. But what if I... Her voice trailed off, and Shinji slowly removed his hand. If something bad happens, I'll buy you a drink, and you'll deal with that too. For what felt like an eternity, silence reigned between them. You didn't look at him, and Shinji just looked forward. Thanks, she whispered. The edges of Shinji's lips curled upwards. Anytime you. It was a strange, hated sensation. The feeling of being completely and utterly exhausted right down to the bone and being incapable of finding sleep. His brain was on fire. His bones felt like glass, the skin of his palms was red and peeling, while his fingers were twitching with splinters of pain between the joints. Everything hurt. Right now, if it meant he'd sleep through the whole of the goddamn school year and fail he would take it and call it a bargain if only he could sleep. But try as he might, he couldn't, brain still turning and churning, with myriad thoughts. He trailed his eyes towards his alarm clock. 5 a.m. He wanted to stay in bed, but he didn't see the point of it if he was just gonna keep tossing and turning. Forcing himself to his feet, Katsuki hissed as a slow, rolling pain made itself known everywhere. He tried to growl but it came out as more of a groan. He'd never taken a pain pill in his life, but right now he was really considering breaking his personal rule. Forcing himself to his feet, he gripped the bed frame to steady himself as the world swam and flipped before riding itself again. He didn't think that he'd ever been this tired in his life. Marching to the bathroom he stepped into the shower, keeping the water cool. He didn't even want to think about heat right now. He stayed under the water, eyes closed and trying to will himself to find sleep even with the shower beating down over his head. When that obviously didn't work he shut off the valve, stepping out and changing clothes before brushing his teeth for the fifth time in as many hours. He could still taste the ash at the back of his throat. When he finally emerged from his room, it was almost seven. He had a short fuse most days, he could acknowledge that, but today the fuse was non-existent. Something in his face must have said as much because everyone gave him a very wide berth as he glowered his way towards the mess while people were still just emerging from their rooms. When he made it there, he was surprised to see it nearly empty. Clearly people were still sleeping in after last night. Not even Gang Orca was here. Nearly empty however was the operative word. Pony was sitting at a table. Well, sitting was a rather generous term. The Japanese-American girl was half sprawled over it, face on the cool metal, arms not even bothering to be used as a pillow. He may have thought she was asleep had her head been turned away, but given the fact that it wasn't and she was staring at him with the same set of bloodshot eyes he no doubt had, she rather obviously wasn't. Her blink was slow, almost languid, like her brain was trying to process what it was seeing and was having some trouble. 
You look like hell. She spoke in English. He didn't have much of an answer for that. She looked just as bad, if not worse. But judging by his mother's example, that was the wrong answer and he was too tired to get into a shouting match right now. H.M. He grunted, turning and walking towards the coffee machine he got himself a full, steaming mug. Black, no cream or sugar. It wouldn't help him sleep, but it might help him crash later. Before long he was sitting across from her, drinking in silence. He downed half the mug before she spoke, still not picking her face off the table. You think this firefighting thing happens often? She asked in Japanese. He shrugged. He hoped not. Give him a villain to punch any day over that hellhole. You thinking of quitting because oh this or something? He mumbled, softly. She snorted. No, it's just not something I ever thought about you know. Like, we've all seen that video of All Might crawling out of a burning building with a bunch of kids. But Guy didn't look like he had a hair out of place. Whatever I imagined being a hero, it usually involved some villains and the occasional rescue. And whatever I imagined in those rescues didn't involve. She trailed off. Something like last night. He could agree to that. He hadn't imagined last night either when he was a kid. They fell into silence again, shorter this time, before she broke it. Kinda amazing when you think about it really. She yawned, finally deigning to pick her cheek off the metal, folding her arms under her to rest her chin over her wrists, staring at him with tired eyes. What is? He answered, a little louder this time due to a little more energy from the caffeine, and tried not to cough as the taste of smoke and ash scratched at the back of his throat. We did this once and we look like hell warmed over. She smiled. Those firefighter guys do it all the time, and most of them were either quirkless or had a quirk that wasn't made for their job. He felt himself go perfectly still. People don't think about that. She continued, eyes closing as she placed her head back down onto the table. The heroes with the big flashy quirks get the spotlight, but those firefighters are just as heroic. You don't see anyone ranking them in the top 10 or giving them sponsorships and stuff. She yawned again kinda sad really. Quirkless or not I still say they're heroes. Back Hugo's grip on the mug's ring handle was tight, and his coffee was ice cold by the time Pony woke up and he remembered the ability to move again. Hero killer behind bars. Hero team up bears fruit, said the headline on the news channel as it played in the dingy bar. With the capture of the hero killer known as Stain, there's a sense of relief going around Tokyo this morning. The talking head with the shitty turtleneck mused. Indeed, it's been a hectic couple of days here in Tokyo through combining the hero killer's defeat and the Hasu attack. The horn dude spoke. Those responsible for the incident are still unidentified. So many people remain uneasy. With a known serial killer off the streets, it is a step in the right direction. Heha. <laughs> Tamura chuckled as he sat in the bar lounge, an open box of cold pizza to his right and a shot glass to his left. Make all the kills you want, but we all know who the real deal is, he said, glaring at the TV screen. One thing we should take from this is that the ones who brought him to justice were none other than a team-up between top 10 heroes Ed Shot and Mirko. And yes, I mentioned Mirko and team-up in the same sentence. Horn Dude spoke as the slideshow covered pictures of the two heroes. A spiky-haired ninja dude and some Hafu Brazilian mutt with rabbit ears. Various outlets tried to reach the Mirko firm for comment but have yet to receive a response. Turtleneck bitch spoke. Horn dude said some shit as Tamura downed his shot, feeling the burn of tequila as he shook his head. He held out his glass, and Kirajiri obliged in pouring him another. Both pros were reportedly aided in the capture by interns, fresh from UA. Hi, UA. Fresh from there too. Wait a minute. Tamura reached into his pocket, and began to surf on social media for latest news on his phone. The news station wasn't showing their names, but people would have surely taken some pictures of Ed Shot and Mirko before and posted them on their feed. As he found the results, those two, Tamura hissed, gripping the shot glass and disintegrating it in his grip before it could shatter and pierce his dried and chapped hand. The spider in green hair in their hero costumes appeared, patrolling alongside the rabbit and the ninja tryhard across the city. Kirajiri was silent, reaching into the cupboard for another one. Tamura ground his teeth as he began to scratch his neck. Even though the bottom line had quotes and comments about the Hasu massacre, the media had to focus on. Those two of all people, he helped them grow by letting Stain get away. If he had just killed the noseless fuck then and there, they wouldn't be getting this level of praise. He just gave them experience points. I wanted Stain to die, to fail, fall flat on his face. He seethed, but not like this, to those fucking two no less. All might at least would have been expected. But, those two, a monkey's paw to be sure, Shigaraki, Kurajiri added, earning the burning red eyes of the teal-haired man. Playing jokes, huh? Shut it, Kurajiri. He slumped, fingernails digging into his skin. I wanna kill them next. 
His red eyes glared hard at the highlights of Midoriya patrolling with Ed's shot, and the American shitter with Bunny Bitch as he scrolled across his feed. The master says the time isn't right. Kirajiri droned, his golden eyes narrowed. As much as I wish to aid you Shigaraki, he desires to rebuild his reserves of Naomo. He is also aiming to build something for you as well. But again, much like in creating the Naomo from his sources, that takes time and patience. The leader of the League of Villains breathed hard through his nose. Teacher said that they couldn't attack their families. Not yet unless he wanted every single hero in Japan bearing down on him at this stage. Or if he could pick them off one at a time. GRRR. He growled, turning around in his chair, glowering at the screen. I need to get party members. Tamura uttered out as he felt a shot glass touch his hand. He took it, guzzling down some tequila once more. Then I can kill who I want, when I want, where I want. The master is working on an arrangement as we speak. Hirajiri responded, earning him the black cloth man's glance. He will inform us of his plans in time. For now, we wait. Waiting sucks, Tamura said, his hand going around his neck as he finished by his neck side. Usually the wrist of his father would be there, touching his knuckles. His anger began to bubble, an audible growl present as he took another shot, drowning it in an instant as he glared at the TV. If only he could feel his father, crushing his face. If only that Gautam Midoriya hadn't taken him away. If only if only if only. Tamura stewed and sulked, gnashing into another slice and chomping hard, trying his best to find the delight in the highlights of the people running from downtown Hasu and seeing the high death count in the several dozens. It worked, but the lack of his father's fingers on his face, and that train of thought always leading to them. Those got him UA. Brats, All Might's time would come. But first, those little shits would get what they fucking deserved. Either by his Naomu, his party members, or by his own bare hands. Izuku took a deep breath, looking at what lay between his hands as he focused his glare at him. No more protein bars. He's eaten enough of them to last a year and frankly, he was sick of them. Focus, he opened his mouth and deposited the rice and meat, even as lightning emitted from his body. The taste of the rice mixed in with spices and meats was as bare bones as could be, usually reserved for fast food rice bowl places but this. The hero in training cried, moaning in delight at the taste. Finally, something that wasn't made in a factory line. I did it, he whined as he slumped in his chair. Across from him, Edshot chuckled as he went about his breakfast. Now now, no need to cry. We can always go back to protein bars if the rice isn't to your liking, he said playfully. Izuku perked up and looked back at his bowl, remembering how he was able to distribute the control of his quirk. The last several days after Stain's capture had been devoted entirely to training, one which Izuku could surmise as both a way for Ed's shot to have him focus on his quirk and as a quasi-punishment of sorts in going after Stain, which was understandable. Combined with doing various chores around the agency using his quirk, Izuku was able to have an easier time. Scrub the floor, wash paper dishes, dust, clean the car, you name it. Whenever he called upon one for all as well, he noticed that he moved faster than he did before, and had higher stamina. He surmised that his base must have grown in some way. Before coming here, calling upon his quirk was limited only to the 5% of its maximum power. But now, without a doubt, the usage of constantly using his quirk for mundane tasks allowed him to reach new heights, or rather, a new floor. If he had to guess, he was around 8 or 9% now, almost a 10, and reaching a huge stepping stone. What are you thinking about? Ed shot asked as he ate, making the boy perk up. Oh, oh, nothing. Izuku replied as he resumed his meal, glowing as he got back to eating, focusing on keeping up the same level of power as he added more rice and meat. You've come a long way, Midoriya. Ed shot mused as he ate from his own meal. Thank you, if not for you. I'm not sure where I would be to be honest, Izuku replied, looking to the side as he went for another bite. You have the brain of a flytrap. You'd have been fine, Izuku perked up. A flytrap? Yep, a sponge can take in a great many things, but... Ed shot lifted his finger chopsticks as he mused. Squeeze it, and the water goes out. The flytrap is sticky, and whatever latches on stays there is when I settled on the green-haired youth. See where I'm going with this. Yes, Izuku nodded, beaming. It's a really good analogy. The ninja hero chuckled to himself. Well, I'm sure you can keep applying these lessons even at home. Doing so while in class might be too much of an endeavor, lest you break all your pencils and pens. Izuku finished taking in another bite, thinking to himself. Yes, doing so at school would be troublesome. The only reasonable way to improve was to utilize his quirk when at home or whenever a battle facility was available. Keeping up his quirk during hero exercises was key too, even when not engaging in anything physical but simply keeping it active should help raise his level of managing it and 
You're mumbling again. Edshot spoke, and Izuku blanched. Sorry, he said, his shoulders slumping as he looked to the side with a blush. Edshot laughed. You're fine. The fact that you're doing this shows you're taking this seriously. Now, go and finish breakfast using your quirk, then take a shower. If I recall, your train departs before noon, yes. Izuku lifted his head and nodded. Yes, is. There any more to learn? The pro hero shook his head. Always. He smiled. But baby steps. For now just continue to apply what I have taught you here. Use this method, and your level of control will increase. And, Edshot smiled. Learn from your experiences, and add that to yourself, so you can better yourself. Izuku finished swallowing another bite from his rice bowl, this time with the egg attached as he heard his mentor's explanation. His explanation. Experiences. He furrowed his brow, remembering that time days ago when he met All Might in the park. His words, what he could have done. Right? Izuku replied as he took a sip of tea. Say, Edshot looked at his watch the day before All Might got there. His eyes rose, seeing his watch. It was a smart watch too. Wait a minute. Izuku's eyes widened. Did he? Figure it out. Was Edshot aware of All Might's condition? What was? Well, look at the time. Edshot said aloud as his watch vibrated, looking at it. I need to go over some proposals on how to improve the training area. He stood up. You finish up and clear the dishes please. I'll see you out, Midoriya. He said with a smile as his eye crinkled. W wait, Edshot saw. Ta. Edshot cracked, zipping away at the speed of sound, leaving Izuku alone in the kitchen. The boy looked at his meal and sighed. He finished his breakfast and cleaned up the bowls before going up to his room. He checked in on his charging phone, seeing his messages. There was a text from his mother, and Izuku bit his lip. After his shower he'd call her to inform her of his train schedule, and to ease her worries about the stain capture again. Hot, Momo grunted out as she poked and thrust out her custom wooden shaft. A blade formed at the end as the image of the Bakken handle as she swung her sword. Then from her open palm, a can of mace appeared and she sprayed in the general direction once. She promptly tossed it aside as she gripped her sword again, swinging each time. Each motion of her swing conjured a new blade to sprout up from within the handle and push the other out as it clattered on the floor. Her mind, solely focused on the creation of an item, then following through on that motion, then utilizing the item, all of it used within a second of each thought. She had done this process again and again, with each day her mind becoming ever more clear and empty, with nothing but the immediate action to take before her. That's enough, Musha said, and Momo relaxed. She looked to the side, seeing her armored mentor sitting on his knees as he observed her. He walked over, bending over and picking up one of the blades she had created, inspecting it. Where he was sitting before was a robot that had two legs and some kind of laser at the top. From Musha's gauntlet, a holographic visual could be seen. She noticed his cheeks rise up in a small smile. You've grown during your time here, Yeyorazu. Your speed has improved. Momo collected herself, wiping her brow clear of sweat as she stood up and bowed in respect. I couldn't have done it without your guidance, Musha-san. Indeed. He turned off his display and crossed his arms. I trust that you'll keep up this form of training when at UA. Or at home, yes. I understand that your quirk requires lipids and food to consume in order to function. I have the resources, it is of no concern. Good. I cannot wait to see how you perform in the future. Musha nodded as he touched down, picking up the speed radar robot. Everything hero creati. He said with a nod as he stepped aside. Musha Sam. Apologies. I am going on a patrol and then attending a conference today, so this will be our last time seeing each other until the future. He bowed lightly. Teaching you has been a rewarding experience, creati. Momo took a deep breath, then bowed respectfully in turn. And learning from you was invaluable, Musha Sam. Keep up the good work and your training, and before long, I have a feeling that you will take my place amongst the top ten. The busty brunette perked up as the old man chuckled. Don't be so shocked. By the time you ascend and surpass my peak, I will be gone and forgotten, as all unneeded relics should be. T there's no need to be so. Um, um Momo didn't know how to react. He wanted her to surpass him now. Well, pressure wasn't something new to her at this point in her life, but still. I have faith that you will. Don't be so hard on yourself, and believe. The old warrior mused. Farewell. He got up and walked down the hallway, leaving Momo alone. The girl sighed as she looked at the mess of blades she had created. Her limo was due to pick her up in a half hour, so it was time to shower and clean up. And with the sound of her stomach growling, have one more of those special shakes from the cafeteria to go. After a nice shower, getting dressed, packed, and thanking the people she worked with for the past two weeks with a big to-go calorie shake in hand, Momo was outside of the Yoroi Musha agency, walking to the curb as she saw her parents' limo. She saw the driver, an average height man with long bloodhound-like ears on his head bow. 
Yeyorazu-san. Madu-san. Shall we return home? Yes please. Momo let him handle her luggage as she got inside, closing the door as she looked out to the castle that had been her home for two weeks. She opened her hand, and it glowed and from it instantly came a matryoshka doll, one of her favorite toys as a child and one of the earliest things she could create. Before, it took just under a second or so to conjure one, as it took little of her resources. Now she could make one within the blink of an eye. Smiling, she leaned back and looked up at the sunroof. She heard Madu settle in the driver's seat after she placed her bags in the trunk and started up the limousine, going onto the main road. Looking at her phone's map, it would take about an hour and change to get back home, what with Tokyo afternoon traffic and all. After that, she would return back to classes. Hopefully everyone had a good time at their internships. Oh, Ida. Momo remembered his screams, his weeping when he was loaded onto the ambulance that night. She'd heard how downtown was a war zone too. It would take months to fix the area. And honor the dead too. Hopefully Todoroki is okay. She thought as she scrolled through her phone, seeing another news article title about the capture of the hero killer. The ones responsible for bringing him in were Ed Shot and Mirko. With help from their interns fresh from UA, Peter San and Midoriya, they had a hand in stopping state. The thought made the black-haired girl feel relieved. The murderer was off the streets now. Hopefully Ida would be okay. Tomorrow would be school, and this week should be the one before the final exams next week. In all likelihood, this week would probably be best used to study up. She felt her phone ring as she saw who was calling her. Momo sighed a bit and answered. Hello mother, Momo. Madu informed me you're safe and on the way home. Do you have an ETA? Two hours at most from my maps. I see. How was your internship under Yoroi Musha? Fruitful, mother. Good. I heard you were in Hasu the night of the attack. Momo heard her pause a bit. How? Are you holding up? I am alright, mother. I was with Musha-san the whole time. Were you hurt at all? No, I'm fine. A pause. You can talk to me. I've been in situations like those in the past before I met your father. She spoke. If you wish to talk about anything about that day, I'm open. Thank you mother, if I am troubled you will be the first to know. In any case, your father and I are going to a conference on I Island this summer, in August. Momo perked up. Do you have any plans that month? I do not. The girl was intrigued as she leaned forward. Well, we thought that we should bring you along. A vacation of sorts. We haven't been on one together in a while. Maya said on the other end. While your father and I will be talking to others, you could go enjoy the island. They have quite the amusement park along with the I Expo taking place during the conference we will be attending. Will you be able to have fun at the park and expo too, mother? There was silence on the other end. I haven't been there in a while. They should have new attractions. We'll see Momo. Maya replied. There are also plenty of inventors and support companies across the globe there. Not to mention the best in the world in the Shield Foundation. I'll set you up for some meetings so you can demonstrate your quirk and potential as a hero. It pays to have connections and use them. I understand. Thank you, mother. Silence reigned again for a moment. You're welcome. Your father and I will be out late again. We're in Osaka on our way back from Deka City in HI. From where? A conversation with the head of a civilian quirk support company. They have promise. We're thinking of becoming an investor for Detnarat. That's good to hear. There was silence again on the other end. Momo. Yes, mother. Momo asked, wondering what she was going to ask. Silence again. It's nothing. I'll see you tomorrow. If I remember, your syllabus states that your final exams are next week. Is that right? Yes. I've been meaning to set up a study group with my classmates since before our internship started. An idea popped up in Momo's head. Mother, if it is at all possible, may I host the group at the house? We would use the library to focus on studying. But she didn't stop there, remembering her training with Musha as she looked behind her at the fading Edo period castle nestled between the skyscrapers. I will also be using the backyard as a training ground of sorts too. Oh, silence ensued at the other end. I, Momo looked to the side. Is that a problem? She prayed not. No, Maya toned. Very well. Bring this study group of friends over. In a way, you teaching them is another form of study for yourself. You may use the credit card for ordering whatever food you like. There was silence on the other end, and Momo could hear Dad talking. Aunt, your father is proud of you. Momo let out a soft laugh, smiling. Thanks, Dad. In any case, I will. Keep in touch, Maya uttered. I'll see you tomorrow, Momo. Goodbye, Mother. Dad. She hung up and sighed. While resting after some training this morning to show how she improved before Musha was in the cards, Momo would need to make plans when she got home. Looking at her phone, she had the email sent to herself of the list she made as well. Patent attorneys not connected at all to her family in any way, but well known. 
Still, this was how she can be the best hero no, the best friend she could be. Yagi Toshinori ran a hand over his face, his gaunt features feeling uncharacteristically more pronounced as he stared at the phone in front of him like it was the scariest villain that he'd ever seen in his life. Quite the accomplishment considering the villains that tried to defeat the symbol of peace on a daily basis. Most of them paled in comparison to the being that he was planning on calling. The number was already on the machine. All that he needed to do was press the call button. He took a deep breath. All right, Toshinori, you can do this. You are here making a call like a normal person. He declared, one for all elevating his stature till the fabric of the suit he was wearing screamed in protest. And on the first ring, his form reverted back as the gravity of the situation hit him like a truck. Oh, what was he doing? This wasn't Toshinori trying to fight against a villain or saving a hostage. It was him trying to get advice on teaching for God's sake. His old mentor would have kicked him through a wall for asking something so simple. Toshinori, best sensei, Toshinori declared, a small amount of blood rushing out of his mouth. I'm glad to hear from you once again, but I have a request to make of you. There was a shuffle at the end of the line, as well as a groan. You don't have to shout Toshinori, the older hero complained. Toshinori swallowed nervously. He probably could have held it back a little bit. Kinda surprised that I got your call, Gran Torino said after a pause. How long has it been since we last talked? Why yes, I apologize for not talking to you sooner, Toshinori said slowly. But for now, I've called to ask for some. Advice. <clears throat> advice. The old man repeated. T teaching advice, the skeletal blonde clarified. He closed his eyes and reflexively prepared himself for the verbal beatdown. A second passed, then two, yet the tongue lashing that lived on as a phantom memory within Toshinori was as silent as his living counterpart. The only thing that came was a gruff humph and the sound of something shifting on the other end of the line. Took you long enough, the way that boy was throwing around one for all in the sports festival against Endeavor's boy was disgraceful. There was that Detroit smash to Toshinori's self-esteem that he remembered. Forgive me, sensei. I taught him as best I could, but I clearly failed in several areas. Don't need to tell me that, the older hero said. The way that he fought in the festival reminded me of you in your early days, without the backlash of course. Speaking of which, what were you thinking letting that boy fire off blasts at 100% without training him enough to withstand the backlash? Toshinori sighed, sitting down on the couch as he rubbed his forehead. W well, the two of us were on a time crunch. That's not an excuse and you know it. Torino barked, making the symbol of peace recoil as if the phone were a pit viper. You should have walked him through the simple steps first, given him some way to get the fine control of one for all down before he broke every bone in his body. I'm almost certain that if you didn't have Chio patching those students up he'd be in the morgue by now. And bye bye one for all and everything Nana and the others before her died for. Toshinori swallowed nervously, a recent memory flashing through his head as he felt his heart clench. He's certainly taking after me, for better and for worse. What did he do? News footage played like a reel in Yaga's mind. He sighed into the mic. I meant what I said when I said for better and for worse, he said, regrettably. There was a pause. Talk to me, Toshinori. What did he do? Toshinori bit his lip, his dark and blue eyes looking to the side as he was unable to talk. He sighed, pinching the bridge of his nose. Can I talk to you about it later? Young Midoriya was a smart boy. He was an amazing learner, but unfortunately, he had incredibly poor taste in idols. It was a small miracle that he managed to get the internship of Ed Shot. Hopefully there was something the ninja hero could pass on that had helped him in a way that Toshinori couldn't. And even then, that was no excuse to stay complacent. Just like how he taught young Midoriya that day in the park, he too must also learn from his mistakes. Toshinori owed it to him and the other students within his class to be better. Because if someone thought that he was doing a good job with his students, there was a news story that he would have to show them. He'll certainly be your successor, Torino said. Toshinori winced. But if that's where you're at, I can only assume that you need some pointers on how to go from here. Yes, I'd be grateful for anything that you're willing to give me. Oh stop it, you're talking like I'm some wise sage, the old man grumbled. I've just been around long enough, you know that. Toshinori heard something shift on the other line, and then a page turned. Alright, I picked up from the gossip that he got Ed shot as his mentor for his internship. If he was his intern, guess he was involved with Stain then. Quite the accomplishment for a first year, Toshinori commented with a small amount of pride and a larger amount of trepidation at that last line. It wasn't just quite an accomplishment, and in fact, there was a not-so-insignificant part of Toshinori that was beaming with pride from the fact that four of his students managed to secure internships with the top ten. Most third years couldn't boast that feat. More than ever, it showed the potential within the class. All the more reason to go beyond when gaining the tools needed to help them excel.
Edshot will figure out something for the control, Torino continued, but you got to find out what it is. Talk to the kid, figure out what he was taught from that young ninja and capitalize on it. Get him to push himself in ways that he needs to use what control methods that he's gained in order to get him through his school days. B but the other students will notice if I favor Midoriya over them. The skeletal blonde frowned. I was brought to UA to teach the next generation, not just Midoriya. There's plenty of ways to give the kid some experience without making it look like you're favoring him. And besides, I favored you when I was at UA, back in the day on Nana's request. He has won for all, Tashinori. You can make exceptions. The rail thin man looked up at the ceiling as he arched his neck. It was true in what he was saying, but he couldn't ignore everyone else. Young Kirishima, young Yeyorazu, and especially young Bekugo and young Parker. Tao, it's this rare idea called using your head, Tashinori. Tashinori coughed up a bit of blood, but he couldn't blame his sickness. He'd walked right into that one. And one more thing, this is the most important part, Torino stressed, stop coddling those kids. Tashinori nearly coughed up another fountain of blood. S sensei, you can't be serious. I'm dead serious, the older hero said through the phone, and the symbol of peace could feel his glare. You need to act like me when I was training you before you graduated and went to America. You remember that, right? How could he forget? The training that Gran Torino put him through in those months could only be described as pure hell. But there was no comparing the two situations. These students were in their first years, and he was in his third year training to fight. Him, Tashinori shook his head, ridding himself of the memory before it could envelop him. I'll try. I, I appreciate your advice, Sensei, but isn't that too much? He asked. Don't be fooled, Tashinori. These are dark times. First the attack on the USJ, now Hasu. Situations are escalating and if you don't put those kids through hell to match that escalation, they're going to run into a situation they can't handle and you don't need me to tell you how that will go down. Tashinori nodded, fighting down the feeling that came with the knowledge of exactly how that type of situation would go down. I'll do my best, thank you for the advice. Call if you need anything else, and before you go Tashinori. Tashinori raised an eyebrow at the way that his old mentor's voice trailed off. It almost sounded like, he was sad, something wrong sensei. Nothing, just an old man remembering things that didn't happen. And with that vague answer, he hung up. Strange, but where was Tashinori to question the man? Heroes didn't live as long as him without being a little weird. Hell, no one became a hero without being a little weird. Either way, he was going to need to think on this. A lot. The last of his gear was stuffed into the duffel bag with a grunt, the zipper closing after a bit of pressure and applied weight. Katsuki gave the room one last look over to make sure he hadn't left anything behind, having already opened every drawer and checked between the mattress sheets just in case. Nothing. Nodding to himself once, the blonde bomber moved to heft the bag up and over his shoulder, only to be interrupted by a knock at the door of his room. He turned. Yeah. The door opened and one of Orca's sidekicks was there. Oh good, you're both still here. The scuba suit wearing man exclaimed, and Katsuki could spy Tsunotori waiting out in the hallway, dressed to leave like he was. Come on, the man cried. Gang Orca needs you both quickly, won't take long. Katsuki raised an eyebrow, curious and a little confused. The man hadn't tell them to gear up so it clearly wasn't an emergency, but if not that then what could Orca need them so urgently for? He got up and marched out, tossing a look towards Pony with an eyebrow raised in puzzlement but got only a shrug in response. She apparently knew little more than he did. They followed the sidekick down the halls, and he recognized the path as leading to Orca's office, seldom used in his experience. The pro hero detested paperwork. Katsuki felt his curiosity grow. Finally, they reached the door, the sidekick stepping to the side and bowing lightly to the both of them before knocking. Come in. The sidekick opened the door, the latch clicking as he turned the knob. When Katsuki moved to step through, he felt himself all but freeze at the door frame. Pony similarly stiffened in shock. Orca was sitting at his desk, and in front of him were four people. Two he didn't know. The girl and the boy he and Pony had pulled out of the fire, on the other hand he did recognize. Orca's large eyes swiveled towards them. Ah, here they are. The family turned at the sight of them and the little girl, who he'd blasted out of the building with, let her face light up like a Christmas tree at the sight of him, tugging at her mother's hand. Tsunotori, Bakugo, this is the Heiskawa family. They have come to offer their personal thanks for your efforts. It was the mother, a rather plump woman that stepped forward first. He expected a bow, perhaps a handshake and profuse thanks, but the lady instantly started bawling her eyes out like Midoriya Inko would. Unlike Midoriya Inko, however, the woman was tall and strong. 
The hug that the blubbering lady offered the both of them was downright crushing and Katsuki didn't know if this constituted the legal definition of an assault, which would allow him to defend himself. His spine certainly felt like he needed to fight back. He saw Tsunotori awkwardly pat the lady on the back as she wheezed out pain comforts. It's alright ma'am, no trouble. The father was a laughably skinny guy next to his wife, and he joined in the efforts of trying to pry the lady off of the two would-be heroes in training. Finally, after a handful of minutes in which the woman finally let them go, the conversation could continue, or rather begin. The father, Mr. Heiskawa bowed low at the waist. On behalf of my family, I can do nothing more than offer my most sincere and deepest gratitude for your actions. There is nothing I could ever do that would repay what we owe you. Oh, that's all right, Tsunotori said awkwardly, smiling with a tinge of nervousness. S no problem. Katsuki felt himself mumble. This was strange. He was used to praise. He was used to adulation. Gratitude, sincere and unfettered. It was beyond strange. The woman kept sniffling, though her crying was quiet now. The boy was younger than them, probably 11, 12 at most, the little girl even younger than that. When the father urged them to give their thanks both children shuffled forward awkwardly and bowed to them. The boy was red-faced and blushing, and Tsunotori smiled as she bowed back. Katsuki was too busy looking at everyone around the room to respond, at least until Tsunotori's hoofed foot kicked him soundly in the shin. He grunted, glared at her and bowed stiffly to the girl. She beamed, and then darted forward, hugging his legs tightly. What the hell was with people and hugs today? He looked down at the top of her head quietly. He felt a muscle in his jaw twitch. Don't stand there like a stiff board, you ass. Tsunotori hissed quietly beside him in English, probably as to not swear in front of the kids. Mind your own business. He snarled back in her tongue before reaching down to pat the girl on the head. She's grown a bit attached, I'm afraid. Mr. Heiskawa chuckled. In her mind, you're the number one hero in the world. For the second time in a single week, Bakugo forgot how to breathe, his hand going stiff and unmoving in the girl's hair. He looked down, seeing her look up at him. The look in her eyes was like his whenever he looked up at all might. When I grow up, I, I wanna be like you, Bakugo-san, she exclaimed. His heart was clenched now, jaw unmoving as his eyes widened. Oh, that's so sweet. Pony smiled, sincerely at the child, before she turned her eyes over to him, becoming significantly more saccharine. You've got your first fan. His teeth clenched so hard that he could have sworn they were about to chip as he ground out the words. I will. Kill. You. Katsuki growled, unmoving. Pony did nothing but giggle and impish glee. It was good to get into a routine again. Peter didn't know how much he missed it until he found himself with nothing to do. At first he walked around the city, taking in the sights and just wasting time while Karen gave him little factoids about the places that he passed. He was thankful for her trying to fill the silence, but he felt guilty for not really listening to her most of the time. After the first day he made it a fact to go incognito and wearing shades and a breath mask. Being a brown-haired American foreign transfer student who won the sports festival made it hard to go about without being noticed. How Mr. Stark got by with all this attention. After the second day, Peter was strolling by a community center and found the place to get his hours. They needed a hand after all. The proprietor was a kind man by the name of Kamikawa Hiroshi. They'd lost their janitor to retirement and several of their volunteers had to go elsewhere. When Peter revealed himself and offered his services and asked if he could check and log his hours to UA. Hi, he was ecstatic for the help from the sports festival first year champion. From that day on, from before opening the doors at 6 in the morning to closing at 9 at night, Peter did his work around the center. Karen memorized his notes, downloaded his class syllabus, and found material worth studying that she could drone in his ear. Two birds with one stone as he got acquainted with maintaining the few sanitation robots and went about cleaning each room of the center. It was actually rather exciting to work on robots. Peter even did a little dumpster diving outside of a mall and got some necessary parts to put some spring into their gears. He used his web shooters to propel him to the ceiling to access the hard-to-reach places to clean up as well, all while making sure the entire establishment was clean. Windows wiped, floors mopped and vacuumed, the toilets were flushed, it was all a good distraction. And there were the daily events, youth sports tournaments to senior bingo nights to auctions. Peter was around and incognito, ensuring the center was going well. He assisted the event managers and their assistants by setting up tables and preparing food. Everything and anything Kamikawa-san asked for, Peter did. All the while Karen listed off in his ear on why the United States became 53 states, bringing in Puerto Rico, and finally the Bahamas and Virgin Islands. 53 just seemed wrong. His shift at the community center came to an end. 
Kamikawa-san was distressed when he told him that he was going back to school to focus on final exams and his hero course, and understood it. Peter made it a note to contact him whenever he found some free time to kill and wanted to help, and thus signed the Treaty of Luka in Cairo, Egypt, for the establishment of a new and updated Suez Canal between the United Kingdom and Egypt. Karen spoke in his ear as he walked into the door of his and Yu's flat. Got it. Treaty of Luca. Egypt. Kayo. Peter perked up, seeing you on the couch watching TV. H. Hey, you. She turned towards him, and the blonde smiled. Hey, a Peter, how was the community center? It's something. Peter answered with a shrug. How about you? How was work? Was it going to be the same old as before? You rolled her eyes. Oh, you know, more of the same petty thugs that think they can get away with anything because they have a cool quirk and think that no one is around. Peter shrugged, throwing his stuff on the small bit of the counter that he'd long since claimed as his own. As he approached, you scooted to the side, letting him sink down on the couch next to her. He let out a small groan as he stretched, his tense muscles slowly unwinding. The TV was on the news, but neither of them really cared about what was being said. Standard weather report with a few crime watches, most of which was talking about All Might and his involvement. Let's talk, you said, swallowing. About what? Peter asked, trying not to cringe, trying to pretend. He was good at pretending. About? You paused, shifting in her seat. She took the remote from Peter's hand and shut off the TV. That thing you told me about. He stared at the black screen of the TV and shifted to the edge of the couch. About what? About what? You repeated in disbelief, Peter, you. You basically told me that you died. He winced. It's not like we can do anything about it. She stood up, marching closer before kneeling in front of where he sat. Her eyes met his sternly. Peter, you talked to me about this. A few days ago, if you didn't feel yourself reaching the end of your rope then you wouldn't have talked at all. So don't pretend that you're just fine and that this is all just gonna blow over because you know it's not and I know enough to know it won't either. She was right. He knew she was right. What are you suggesting? He asked, smiling weakly. I don't think they make pills for this. She flushed, embarrassed. I hadn't really thought of anything yet. There was an awkward silence between them for a moment, though the awkwardness seemed to stem from her and her admission more than anything else. His smile was sad but understanding. It had been a lot to take in. Finally she snapped out of it, shaking her head. Okay, let's go step by step. After staying, what was it that bothered you the most that night, if you had to name one thing? He paused, thinking. It wasn't so long ago as for the memory to fade, but rather that there was so much he'd done wrong. He thought of Midori. Mirko's words. Putting others at risk. It sounded like a question. Why did you put others at risk? Peter looked in front of him. Because I went after Stain alone. And why did you feel like you had to do that? You inquired, probing further. He turned his eyes upwards to the ceiling. Thinking. Self-evaluation was not an exercise he particularly enjoyed. I don't think. It's about me doing it that bothers me, you. I think I did the right thing. I think it's more about how I didn't even think about any of the risks. They didn't even factor in. I did the right thing. The wrong way. He shrugged, letting it off his chest. All right. She exclaimed, and then hesitated. So, you know what's bothering you the most so now you just need to figure out why. I didn't think of the risks because I didn't want to. He said, guessing her train of thought as he spoke. Because it's easier to not think about the possibility of dying when you've died once already. There. He'd said it. He'd acknowledged the reality aloud. She stopped, startled, and then her eyes grew incredibly sad. She seemed to deflate where she knelt before bringing her arms up to press her palms to her forehead, fingers gripping her hair. Peter felt guilty then and there, feeling his heart tighten up. I think I'm screwing this up. She murmured. I'm sorry. He meant it too. She looked at him. Their eyes meeting in the absurdity of their shared sentiments elicited a small laugh from the both of them. For what it's worth, I don't think you're messing things up. He reassured his guardian, putting a hand on her shoulder. She snorted out a laugh, because clearly we're both experts, eh? There was another bout of silence, thick and pregnant with thoughts, though not as awkward as before. Finally, she took a deep breath, bunching up her shoulders like she was gathering her nerves. Tell me something about your world. He blinked, startled. What? She looked a little sad. I don't really know how I can fix this Peter, but maybe it'll help if you just talk about things. Good things. So every day I want you to tell me one good thing about what you remember from your world. Remembering the good might help you deal with the bad. He smiled, shrugging. Not sure how much I can say that you'll get. I don't think you've ever had a Philly cheesesteak. The look on her face confirmed his suspicions. She did understand one word there though. Cheesesteak. Oh, I'm down for tepon. You beamed. I was thinking about going for sushi instead at this new place, but Tepan. Absolutely. He chuckled. 
You sure? I'm in a steak mood. Come, you put her finger to her chin in thought. She clapped her hands as Peter saw the metaphorical light bulb turn on in her head. I know a place that does both downtown. Okay. Peter nodded as he got up and walked past the blonde woman, turning back and looking at her. He saw her go to her room on the other side of the flat. Hey you. Yeah. Peter gave a soft and warm smile, even with his eyes red and near the point of tears. Thanks. The curvy blonde gave the biggest grin. It's what big sisters are for. She said with a thumbs up, going back to her room with a skip to her step. We can ask them to put cheese on the steak too. I'll demand it. Peter laughed, and it felt good. Sure, let's do it. He closed the door leading to the bathroom and saw his reflection in the mirror, saying the word from a simple street-side greasy cheesy meat sandwich, uttering that. Never felt so good. He smiled and got busy getting cleaned up. He had a quasi cheese steak tepan style with his name on it waiting downtown. So alright folks that's all for today. Stay tuned for part 15. Do subscribe, like and share for more such videos. Press the bell icon to be notified first on release. See you in the next video till then goodbye.